Good afternoon. It's nice to see so many people in the audience today. Um, we are um, starting our Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners meeting for Thursday, September 12th, 2014. Um, we do not have anybody presenting the invocation today, so I ask Commissioner Eggers to um, do a very nice um, presentation that he did yesterday at the Forward Pinellas meeting. And it will be um, talking about 9-11, um, uh, um, 2001, as well as um, honoring Michael Schmidt. And so I will turn this over to Commissioner Eggers at this point for his very eloquent well, thoughts. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, you know, we, uh, we each of us in this room and around the county, um, obviously all of us have different times in our lives. There's lots of emotion happens, a lot of changes go on, and things that happen that really affect our lives in the, in the immediate sense. And I was just reflecting on the last few weeks about many things that uh, have touched our lives in one way or another. And uh, one of them was um, an honor flight that I went to on Tuesday night um, uh, watching 50 plus veterans and their chaperones return from Washington and they get to go up about three or four in the morning. They fly up to Washington and, and get to spend the day and they're treated royally uh, as they should have been. And when they come back, they uh, land and the, they, they greet them with um, envelopes of cards of thanks and, and uh, for their service and, and all of the things that, uh, that they mean to these individuals, whether they're kids or adults really an emotional time uh, for them. Then they come out into the baggage area where there are literally hundreds, probably close to a thousand people waiting for them. And they come through a waiting line and it just the emotion that sweeps over them in an instant is amazing. Uh, many of them have never been welcomed back. And so it's just a really a really profound time and, they're, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the hosts that take them are equally moved. Um, at the very end, they have a, a, a playing of the, of the uh, national anthem. And it's always at the very end where the, those folks that are in wheelchairs come out. And so they're there at the end. And of course, they immediately turn back towards where they're playing it. And, uh, and these guys that can't walk struggle to stand up and just when that, when that anthem is being played, and it changes our life, the people that get to see that right in front of them in an instant. Um, it was just a very moving, a moving, a moving uh, tribute to our, to our veterans. And then yesterday I was uh, lucky enough to go to a 9-11 ceremony, really reflecting back on, on what happened 18 years ago um, and the horrific nature of the day and the many, many heroic stories that came out from our first responders and folks like you and me, normal folks that aren't first responders who did heroic things that day. Um, and the families' lives of those that were lost, how they changed in an instant. And, but how our country rallied around that time was pretty special. And um, sometimes I wish we could just hold on to that a little bit more and knock out all that other noise that we hear today. Um, it changed lives in an instant. And then, and then uh, clearly, recently, our brothers and sisters from just a stone's throw away from Florida in the Bahamas experienced something that, thank God, we didn't. But their lives changed dramatically. Um, and I have no doubt that this country, people in this room have already, I know, stepped up and sent things over there to help out in that very initial phase of just trying to survive. But, uh, you know, again, just amazing things that happen from horrible instances and, and, um, and how lives get changed in just, in just a second. Um, and then a much, much closer to home uh, within the last week or two, one of our, our board reporters who frequently sits right here where Chris is sitting, um, his name's Michael Schmidt and um, died of a heart attack while on the job. Um, just a great guy, just, just doing his thing. Um, in fact, I've tried to emulate him going up and down the steps, those four stories, of, and it's, it's exhausting. I'm not sure I'll keep that out much longer. But 
he was just a really neat guy, and he had his family. Obviously, their lives changed in an instant, and, and the family of board reporters right over there that day was just forever. will never change. It will never, that, that will always be with them. And, um, and so we've all been through that in, in many different ways, but those are just some of the things that have hit us nationally, but also here close to home. And um, just wanted a chance for us all to reflect a little bit yesterday, especially on 9-11, the things that mean so much to us. And so thank you for the opportunity to say it again. But uh, I hope our country um, holds on to days like 9-11 ceremonies because, gosh, we need it bad because there's so much bad noise going on out there. They're telling us how we're supposed to hate each other if we don't think alike mm. or if we're not alike. And that's just not the way we are. So anyway, that's all I had for you today. But if we if all just take a, maybe a half a moment of silence, that would be great. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much, Commissioner Eggers. I think you were sharing so many of the thoughts that all of us are feeling, and we're very appreciative of the eloquency Thank that you. you've expressed yes. in our behalf. So. Okay, Commissioner Welch, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please stand. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which, which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I have several presentations to make. Um. First, I um, would like to ask Bill Berger, who is the Director of the Office of Management and Budget and his budget office staff to come join me. Hi. How are you doing? That's why our room was packed with so many nice looking faces. <laughs> and it's especially appropriate that this staff is coming forward today because tonight will be our first public hearing for our proposed um, 19 to 20 budget. And um, these are the folks who work hard in our behalf every day. They um, help to budget and to expend and to watch your taxpayers' money. And that we're so appreciative of, very much so. Because we know you, you're good, Watchdogs, and we like that. <laughs> so um, today, would you like to introduce those that are here? I'd love to. Um, and before I get started with the people who are here, um, it takes a village, and the village is not even all here. Um, there are some that couldn't make it, so I just want to <coughs> acknowledge them. Um, Belinda Amundsen, Daniel Nunez, Janie Gardner, Jennifer Stagner, Linda Larkins, Maria Cascone, Rose Pasek, Shane Kunza, Sharita Jones, Susan Kohler, Tiana Walker, Linda Benoit, and Kathy Wazlewski. And Kathy, congratulations to her. She's in Puerto Rico. She's retired. Um, but <laughs> this is talking about this year's budget document, and she was part of that. So, um, And with that, I'll start over on my left. My left? Yeah, this is my left hand. <laughs> um, Ralph Reed, Erica P Mitchell. I still want to call her by her maiden name. <laughs> Uh, Jackie Trainer, Lori Sullivan, Lisa Burley, Catherine Burbridge hiding behind Lisa Burley, <laughs> Cecilia McCorkle, Yana hiding, Matiuk hiding behind her, Shannon Mills, Frederica Collins. <laughs> Sorry, there there have been a lot of happy days where we have marriages going on. <laughs> so, Kristen Williams, Jason Miller, Kristen Kerr, Aubrey Phillips, Don Mello. Emily Magyar, Evelyn Esteva Stevens, and congratulations to Evelyn because this is her last time that she'll be here, at least as an employee. She's going to be retiring. And actually, I forgot to mention Catherine's going to be retiring also. <laughs> Look at that nod. <laughs> See how happy that face is? 
that's the face of happiness. Uh, Jason Rivera, Jim Abernathy, Drew Brown, Tim Crowley, Veronica Attell, Maria Roberts, Aaron Dowie, Joshua Harmon Schaefer, and standing in the front looking dapper with the purple, <laughs> Krishna Gandhi. <laughs> Well, again, thank you. Um, you know, I've been in Pinellas County government for, for since 1999, and um, I have to say that each year the budget becomes that much more transparent and that much more trustworthy. And again, it's due to all of you. Um, we really, really appreciate what you do. And it's really the, the whole thing that runs county government is our budget. And so what you do is really critically important. So with that, we have a um, Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget. Um, the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada awarded the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award to the Pinellas County for the annual budget beginning October 1st, 2019. The award represents a significant achievement it reflects the commitment of the governing body and staff to meeting the highest principles of governmental budgeting. In order to receive this award, a governmental unit must publish a budget document that meets program criteria, criteria as a policy document, as an operations guide, as a financial plan, and as a communications device. Budget documents must be rated proficient in all of these four categories. And there's 14 mandatory criteria within those categories to receive this award. In addition to receiving the award, the county budget received special performance measure recognition as a result of an outstanding rating by all of the reviewers. So I am extremely pleased to present this award to the staff from the off of the Office of Management and Budget in recognition of the development of the 2019 fiscal year budget. If I could just add also that um, we really appreciate all the recognition uh, that we get from you all as a commission. Um, and it's great that we receive that and I appreciate receiving that on behalf of the team. But really we can't do it without the partners that we have out in the departments. Uh, people like Claritha, who thank you Claritha for your years of service. Yes. Um, Claritha is a big part of that. Um, and in every single department and agency we have people that we work with, whether it be a department director a budget and finance person or other folks in the department that really enable us to be able to put this all together. And uh, just so appreciative of those partnerships that we have. All right, well again, thank you all individually and collectively very much. <laughs> Let's see how much they really like each other. Come on. Come on, you know what 20% is. <laughs> Squeeze in. Okay, next we have the National Hispanic Heritage Month Proclamation. And I'd like to ask Jacqueline Bolin, who is the um, CEO of the Intercultural Advocacy Institute and their board of directors, to join me here at the podium.
and I'll have everybody introduce themselves. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Well, Jacqueline? Yes. <laughs> I'm Jacqueline Bullen, and I'm the CEO at the Intercultural Advocacy Institute, and we operate the Hispanic Outreach Center and Hispanic Leadership Councils in Pinellas County. Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Padilla. I'm the coordinator of youth programs at the Hispanic Outreach Center. Hello, everyone. I'm Judge Rosari, and I'm an at-large uh, at board member of the Hispanic Outreach Center. I've been with the center for many years. Good afternoon, my name is Andrea Vendetti. I'm the coordinator of the Hispanic Outreach Center in Clearwater. Good afternoon, I'm Officer Raniel Heredia. I'm the Hispanic officer, uh, Outreach Officer for the City of Clearwater, assigned to the Hispanic Outreach Center. Good afternoon, everyone. Victor Avila, uh, Managed Community Development Banking for Regions Bank. I'm a board member. Hi, I'm Stan Vitito, Provost of the Clearwater campus of St. Petersburg College, and I'm a board member as well. Thank you so much. Um, Pinellas County fosters the value of respect and appreciation for our diverse and multicultural community. And while 10% of Pinellas County's population identifies as Hispanic or Latino, and Pinellas County recognizes the rich heritage of Hispanic and Latin Americans in our county, and Hispanics and Latinos across the United States have made significant con contributions in the cultural, health, justice, military, and social fields, among many others. And these achievements are especially honored each year during the months of September and October. So th now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that September 2019 be rec recognized as His Hispanic Heritage Month. On behalf of the Intercultural Advocacy Institute, we are honored to receive this proclamation today. And we'd just like to say that we are at the center continually inspired by the Hispanic families that we serve here in Pinellas County. We have seen their strength and resilience, their hard work through long nights and early mornings, and most importantly, their tremendous pride for their culture and for their children. And I think that family and a strong sense of social ties is a lesson that we can take with us today as we begin Hispanic Heritage Month, that if we support each other, care for one another, then we can help create the strong sense of community that we want to have. And what we have seen at the center is that if we celebrate each other and our differences, that is key for our future. And especially now, I think that encouraging and driving a variety of opinions in our community brings about new ideas, fosters and inspires a generation for their new voice, and drives positive change for us all in Pinellas County. So thank you very much for this honor. Thank you, and thank you to each and every one of you for what you do for our county and our citizens. You'll have to. <laughs> Good to see you, Judge. Thank you. Next, we have a special um, proclamation uh, for a 25th anniversary, and this is for Maddie Williams Neighborhood Family Center. And they are celebrating, as I mentioned, the 25th anniversary. And I'd like to ask Janet Hooper who is the CEO of Maddie Williams Neighborhood Family Center and any other board members to present to join me at the podium. Hi, how are you? Good to see you too. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. After you start, introduce yourself. Okay. I'm Janet Hooper. I'm the executive director of the Maddie Williams Neighborhood Family Center. You guys come on. 
Hi, I'm Jenny Hall, and I'm a board member. Mark Howe, president of the board. Karen McKinney, board member. We also have two more board members, uh, Marcy Salazar and Hattie Canton are sitting in the audience. Okay. okay, thank you. So Maddie Williams Neighborhood Family Center has provided programs and services to nurture and strengthen children, youth, adults, families, and communities through education, support services, and partnerships to improve lives and create a better future since 1994. Over the past 25 years, Maddie Williams Neighborhood Family Center has transformed from a small volunteer organization into a comprehensive social services agency that serves a wide geographical area in Pinellas County, including Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, and Eastern Clearwater, where there are significant pockets of low-income families. So what we'd like to do today um, is to watch a brief video to learn more about the Maddie Williams Neighborhood Family Center and the services that they provide to our county. It's the Maddie Williams Neighborhood Family Center. It's a family center for people like you. And me. And me. Maddie Williams means bringing people together. To create change. Improve lives. And strengthen communities. It helps people move higher. At Maddie Williams, we believe that strong families are at the center of strong communities. We believe that working together, change is possible. I know my teachers care about me. I don't give up. I am learning and growing. In my world, I can make a difference every day. At Maddie Williams, we show respect for all. Alentamos la diversidad. Honramos el voluntariado y construimos asociaciones de colaboración. And I know that when I contribute my time and resources to Maddie Williams, that I am making a difference. Now I can put food on my table. Give my child breakfast before school. My children can start school with the right tools and receive holiday presents that no one else could give them. Now I can get help filing my taxes and keeping my water and electric utilities on. I am hopeful about my future. So everybody works together. When we work together, we can do anything. We can do anything! Maddie Williams is the leading social services organization in Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, and Eastern Clearwater. Maddie Williams is deeply grateful for all the support you've given us over the past 25 years, and we look forward to working together with you to make a difference in the future. Community, unity, yeah. Okay, um, so doing things. This is our Employee Recognition Award, and today we're honoring Officer Parker. Our employees work hard every day to make our community a better place. In our ongoing video program, we recognize <clears throat> individuals who exemplify the dedication of our Pinellas County team. It's only through our employees and the excellent work they do that we can fulfill our vision. 
to be the standard for public service in America. Our code enforcement officers are committed to making Pinellas County a better, safer place to live. They work with the residents to keep properties in compliance with our local laws and ordinances. But Officer Parker goes the extra mile to make the job easier for his co-workers and quicker for our residents with code concerns. He transitioned our code enforcement process from a time-intensive paper format to a quicker electronic citation. Parker exemplifies the innovation and dedication that helps Pinellas County set the standard for public service. Officer Parker and Mr. Administrator, would you join me here at the podium? So we're going to play a video and it gives us a snapshot of the work that Officer Parker does every day. Most Pinellas County residents do their best to be a good neighbor. The destination is on your right. The few who don't may get a visit from Officer Parker. If the code wasn't there, a property owner could have a hole in the roof and wouldn't have to fix it, you know, unless he, unless he or she wanted to. And then you have tenants uh, living in, uh, in squalor. Everyone gets a chance to do the right thing and voluntarily comply before facing a potential fine. Parker's focus is on those problem properties that have been difficult to bring into compliance. They may be abandoned or pose serious safety hazards like a damaged building, waist-high grass, or a rusted broken vehicle. Our goal is always compliance uh, with the Pinellas County Codes and Ordinances, uh, which are put there to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Pinellas County. But when it comes to the enforcement side of the job... Well, here's the new citation. Parker has found a new way to make the process easier for both the county and residents. Code enforcement used to involve a lot of handwritten paperwork. The excessive time spent filling out the same information again and again meant other safety issues went unresolved for longer. That's why Parker created an innovative electronic citation, which has dramatically cut down on both time and errors for officers. Less time on paperwork means more time investigating residents' code concerns. Whereas before, if you had to spend roughly 15 minutes filling out one citation, with the new electronic citation, it's much faster. Uh, we average, you can average about four minutes to fill out one citation. The program is being adopted by other county departments and is even being considered by partners. So we're able to issue the citation allowing the, the citizen to realize the magnitude of the situation and ultimately come into compliance in less amount of time. We have reduced our response time from approximately nine days to two to three days. It's also reduced our cost by approximately 70 percent. Parker says he loves working at a place that encourages innovation. You know, at the end of the day, my job helps the people around and makes this county a better place. For Parker and his code enforcement colleagues, that means a healthier, safer Pinellas County. I'm Officer Parker, and I am Pinellas County. Would you like to say a few words? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually not one for a lot of words, uh, but uh, I couldn't have done this without the, the outstanding leadership of uh, my department from uh, Officer Oberly, Officer Vargas, Officer Baruti, our division manager, Jude Reason, uh, Blake Lyon, uh, Jake Stowers, and uh, of course all the other officers in the department. Uh, you know, it's, you, you can't do it by yourself. It's, uh, it's a team effort. Well, we certainly and, uh, understand that and appreciate all that code enforcement does for our citizens. I remember that's something that Commissioner Welch and I have worked hard to make sure we could add more officers um, as we could when the economy started to recover. So you do important work. And uh, last but not least, I, I definitely want to don't want to forget to thank my wife uh, and uh, all of and all of her and all of her support. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten my husband upon occasion. <laughs> Mr. Burton? Well, just to follow on to that one, finding efficiencies and doing our job and making it easier, you know, benefits everyone, right? And so, you know, congratulations on a successful project. Those are not easy projects to implement. And so, you know, from that, you know, congratulations and thank you. Um, but also, just from, you know, doing your job. Code enforcement is a hard area. I'm going to come out in a couple of weeks and go right around with you, but I know 
how hard it is to gain that compliance and try to work in tense situations. So again, to you and all, everyone out there, thank you for all you do. Um, and uh, again, congratulations on a successful program. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to, others to come up and be in the photo? Uh, Dr. White? Do you want to come up and? OK. Anyone else? Hey, and next we're um, very privileged to have a partner presentation by Steve Cleveland, who is the Executive Director of the Florida Dream Center. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. How are y'all? Great. Good. Thank y'all for having me here today. Um, is this, uh, how do we turn this just, quick? It's, it's on, right? It's on. It's yeah. on here. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Um, as you guys know that the Florida Dream Center started in November of 2014, the first day of November, and we're getting close to our fifth year now, um, just a couple months away, and we're, we're pretty, pretty proud of that, that we've gone this far and, and the amount that we've been able to accomplish in the, the five years that we've been doing this. So we know, you know we're in Lillman to start out with. Um, we start out on the corner of uh, 39th and 52nd Avenue. We quickly outgrew that and moved to Little Powell on 54th and 39. And since then, we've outgrown that site, and we're at Transfig Transfiguration Church. So we're growing. And we're also in Tarpon Springs uh, every Saturday also. So our, uh, our main program, as, as you know, is the Adopt-A-Block program, Boots on the Ground concept. Um, and you should have a, did they give you guys a brochure? Yes. Okay. okay, good. Um, you know, last year we had 61,000 and some odd volunteers. It says 65, but that's pretty close when I rounded the numbers out. Um, over 1,500 tons of trash has been removed from Pinellas County, and that was with a partnership that we had with County Sanitation and with the City of Tarpon Springs. Uh, they take our trash for free, and County Sanitation gives us one to two to three to four dumpsters a weekend, depending on the size of project that we're doing. Uh, and just the, alone in Lillman, that adds up to about $82,000 since we started that county sanitation has donated to us and back to the county. So we're really very appreciative of James Roberto and his, his work that he does with us. Our community service, uh, we work very closely with code enforcement, uh, especially in the Lillman area and Tarpon Springs. Uh, we have done some other code enforcement projects in Seminole, Largo, Palm Harbor, and um, South St. Pete, depending on the, 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 the nature of the uh, code enforcement. But we, we try to find out when um, the code enforcement officer goes up and talks to the resident and gives them a ticket and, and needs to find out if the resident really can afford to pay the fine and if, it's, or if they're habitual or not. And if they feel that the, the, the 
the resident is um, a value to the community and he's not a, a, a nuisance, they give them our phone number and a business card and ask them to call us. And then we'll go look at the pro project. And if we feel that we can do the project in a timely manner, we adopt that program. We send an email to code enforcement that we have taken over this project and asked for 30 days to get into compliance. And we do quite a bit of that. Uh, we, our, our goal is to keep people in their houses and not let anybody become homeless. And it's just adding to the problem. Uh, and we're, we're, uh, we're able to do that through our partnerships with the, with the county, with the real estate board, with Home Depot, Lowe's, and other organizations that give us the material to do the work our volunteers do. Uh, we get a lot of kids that come out and um, they do, um, they have a lot of opportunities with Bright Futures. They can do all the Bright Futures scholarship hours with us and we get a lot of kids. We also get a lot of kids that the, the, the ladies and gentlemen in black robes send us. Uh, I was at the Juvenile Justice uh, Board the other day meeting and uh, didn't realize that we're doing about 60% of the juvenile uh, department in the Pine Isles County area, especially Lillman and the Tarpon Springs area. So, and what's neat about that, they come kicking and screaming. The parents bring them and say, you got to do 30 hours, 20 hours. And I, uh, they do their hours and they're out either mowing or painting or picking up trash or doing something with the crews. And um, I sign off on their paperwork. The paperwork goes to the judge and I never think I'll never see him again. And two weeks later, I look up and go, what's he doing here? Well, his parents are here and they want to talk to you. I go talk to the parents and they go, I don't know what you did to my kid, but now he's got us coming back here to volunteer with you. So that's pretty cool. That's a, a, a good thing that we, uh, we get to see the kids wanting to get back after they realize they did something wrong. Our mobile food pantry, a um, million point one pounds last year we give, gave away. In the back of your pack, and I stuck in uh, the uh, August numbers, uh, and you'll see some year to date. So we're at over 500,000 pounds year to date right now uh, for this year. So I know we'll hit over a million. Um, not only do we give out food in Lillman and Tarpon Springs, but we also help 32 other partners give food. We give food to 32 other partners. Uh, they could be pantries, they could be a low income areas where 55 plus communities are. And so we take that, we run six days a week with our trucks taking food to these communities. In the Lumen area alone, our adoptive lot program, 1,229 families were fed, are fed monthly through our adoptive lot program. And over 841,000 meals are provided each year. This year is going to be a great year because we have a new partner this year. We're partnering. Uh, we did a trial partnership last year with Metropolitan Ministries. This year we've uh, confirmed the partnership for Thanksgiving and Christmas. We gave out 1,000 meals last year at uh, Christmas time with the help of Metropolitan. We're going to give out 2,400 meals this, this year. Uh, that's 128,000 pounds of food. Our re your, uh, we were getting some questions from officials that wanted to know why people were getting food boxes and the, you, why repeated food boxes. So we came up with a resident advocacy program. And we have social workers that work with us and they go out on Saturdays to the sites, to one of either Lillman or one of the five locations, or one of the five locations in Lillman or Tarpon Springs and they rotate. And they'll meet with clients and find out why they're getting a second box instead of just the one box. And we ask them to come in, in the office and find out if they have uh, financial issues. Uh, they're not making enough money uh, with their job. They have a, a, a dead-end job that's not going to get anywhere for them. So we work with them to try to get them out of the food box situation and get them to be stable. So that's something we started about six months ago, keeping records of this. Uh, we started a year ago, but we've got records now that we can go back and look at to answer those questions when we're asked. Um, we also were we certified with SNAP, so we can do SNAP registration right at the tables with our uh, workers who are there uh, to anybody that needs to get SNAP. And a lot of people in the Lillman community, they are not ready for transitional help. That means they have, they have a driver's license they can go and get, fill out, they have a computer. A lot of people that we get to help, they don't know where to go get a driver's license. They don't know where to find their birth certificate. They don't, you know, they don't even know how to get an ID. And so we, we work that. And some of them actually freeze up when they go to talk to some, somebody. So we send an advocate with them to make sure they get, get what they need. Uh, we provide housing assistance, Medicare, Medi uh, Medi uh, Medicaid registration, ID assistance, transportations to appointments. We got a grant so that we could take people to these facilities. Might be your probation officer. It might be a, a doctor's appointment. It might be uh, 
pharmacy or something else that you need to go to. So we schedule those appointments and we take them. Our advocates work with other social services, 211, um, uh, uh, the Gulf Coast Legal Services, the Exchange, and other organizations here where our people we can send people to, to to find more services that we can't provide. So we, we had a gentleman come to us not too long ago and he asked us about doing some work readiness training. One soft skills we started out with, just teaching some soft skills to people that haven't had a job so they could learn how to keep a job or at least try to get a job. And he actually he said to us he wanted to see if we could teach him how to read a tape measure because he's in the construction business and he says if you can teach these men to, be, to read a tape measure, I can give them a dollar an hour raise and they won't have to shovel anymore. I'll put them within a, in an apprentice program and so we've been doing that. Um, we help with the supportive unemployment for underskilled. That's where we have our workforce training. Uh, we have classes that we conduct one to two per month, and up to, it's up to only six individuals at a time. It's a lot of hands-on, so they get a lot of uh, specialty training and, and, and work with them. A lot of these people never had a job, or they don't know how to keep a job, and they have some issues. So we try to work with them to get through that. January of 2008, uh, we had 68 participants in our workforce training program. 96% certificates, certifications were completed. 47% immediate employed, 96% retention of employment, and 53 additional cases of management introduced to aid with barriers. That could be all kind of mental health. It could be other issues that we had to deal with or get them help with. And that's uh, some pictures of our forklift training and our um, couple of our graduates. And we also do uh, Maintenance of traffic training, where that's the people that we yell at because they're not turning the sign fast enough on the roads. Um, and so, you know, actually that job pays $12 an hour, a minimum to start. And if it's a nighttime job, um, it could be up to 18. Uh, they get a three-year certificate, uh, three, I'm sorry, they get a, a lifetime certificate when they take the class. It's state certified. And the forklift is a state certified class also, and it's a three-year certificate. So they're actually getting something. They're not just getting a piece of paper. They're getting a documentation that's worth something. And then the one that we've been working on that we've, uh, we started, I don't think it'll ever end, but we're getting close. Uh, we're putting the roof on this weekend, uh, is our tiny home projects uh, to uh, build tiny homes that will enhance the neighborhood. Uh, we're collaborating with Perk on this first project. It's actually uh, over there on Prescott Street that somebody might know about. One block over, yeah. Well, yeah, one block behind. And... Uh, so we've, we've got that one going, and, and so far the, uh, the, count, uh, the city has been uh, amazed at the uh, quality of workmanship we're getting out of the, the men and women that are helping build this. And uh, it's a Cat 5 tiny home, believe it or not. It's, a cat, it's rated for Cat 5, and you'd have to come see it to see all the hurricane straps and tie-downs and uh, the 16-gauge uh, metal that we're using. And uh, there's no wood in this. It's uh, termite-free. It's all... Uh, all metal, all wood, I mean, no wood, uh, composite uh, concrete floor and tile, and, and termites aren't going to eat this one. So it's, uh, it's a good thing, and we're looking to do more by, uh, you know, looking at some areas to put some villages together if we can um, find the right land and maybe do some other stuff. But we want to get the first home built so that everybody can do the Missouri thing, touch me and show me and see it and all that good stuff. So, and here's a picture of, uh, this is, uh, it's the, the trusses are on, it's framed, and uh, now we've uh, got our last inspection, and now we're ready to put the, the roof on, and then we'll be closing it in. And that's about the end of the program for what we've got. Uh, I do appreciate uh, you guys partnering with us, and, and we, we love the opportunity to keep doing things, and thank you again for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious, how much did the tiny home cost? Well, the, the, the Cat 3 tiny homes, they should run about $22,000 to build. The Cat 5 is like $80,000. 80? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's very expensive. I mean, just one, one of the uh, corner clips that holds, uh, that holds the studs in place is $28, and there's over 50 of them. And then you've got the other clips that are, you know, anywhere from eight to nine dollars a piece. And then sixteen gauge uh, uh, galvanized steel studs. Uh, uh, they're 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 up there. They're about eighty to five to ninety dollars a piece. And trusses, galvanized trusses. I mean, but the reason for that was to show that this can be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can build a Cat Five. Uh, but I think there's. Uh, 
nine windows in this building, and the windows cost nine thousand dollars. So, and they're 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 rated for major impact, uh, wind loss. I mean, not wind loss, vacuum loss, so they don't blow out or suck in. So it's uh, when we get done, everybody will be able to come see it and uh, yeah. wonder what we're going to do with it next. So, uh, <laughs> Steve, thank you for what you do. We thank really you. appreciate. It. I remember when the organization got started, and oh my, what yeah. you've accomplished has been. Well, we, um, we keep trying, truly... and it's the it's not it's not us. It's the volunteers and the partnerships that we have that make this work. And it is. I'm seeing those volunteers out there making a I difference. No one that has volunteered. <laughs> Several Tremendous. of y'all. Yes, it's, it's quite an eye-opening experience. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I want to recognize, since Steve forgot, but I'm sure he didn't mean to forget, uh, Zelda O'Connell is uh, in the audience and is... Uh, Actually, uh, Zelda is the glue. She's the glue that holds us together, Zelda O'Connell. Uh, she's uh, the director of our programs. When, when this organization started... And I, I, one time we were out in, in a conversation, and I shorted it a couple of years. I said, you've been going three years. He has five, five years. And he, and, uh, but when it started, it was one of those organizations that we've all seen that we thought, this is kind of too good to be true, the mm -hmm. work they were doing and the efforts. Yep. And this is really not going to last that long, the work that they're doing. And uh, the proof is in the pudding, and the five years and the work that you all do is just absolutely amazing and life-changing, and we can't thank you enough. Thank you for having us, really. I appreciate that. Commissioner Welch. Thank you. I, I echo Commissioner Justice's comments. Uh, your work has been truly transformative. And I also want to thank you for sharing the wealth. Uh, you actively went into other parts of the county and to South St. Pete as well. Um, one question I have for you on the tiny home. The, did you say a Cat 3 was around 20000 Yes, sir. Cat okay. 3. And actually, we're looking at a, uh, a new version right now that might even be able to lower that a little bit. We're, we're partnering up and looking at some numbers with uh, uh, um, Martin Gramatica with his SIP panels, and his SIP panels are rated to, uh, through Miami-Dade, they're, they're uh, rated to uh, Cat 3 hurricane standards. And if we get those and we can manufacture those with our uh, same layout and footprint, uh, we can put the walls up and the roof on in a day and a half. And this is just south of Tropicana Field, uh, right off 16th Street, just if you want to locate it. But I had a chance to see it when it was first starting and just... Mm -hmm. So folks understand, these are folks that are going through PERC. These are ex-offenders. Yeah, the STARS program, uh, some PERCs, uh, some of the kids, uh, men and women going through PERC, and some that aren't, some that are just people walking up and they they they, uh, they sign up for the program and they go through the program. So and they're learning a construction skill and being... They, uh, they get the... That's that's one of the... Being a, being a general contractor, I, I never could build a home like this because I'd never make any money. But uh, it's very slow because each person gets... A chance to actually cut and learn so you might have eight guys there so you get one stud up that's all you get up for one day you know and then they have they only work a couple hours because they have to go to p tech for class and so it's, <coughs> it's, it's driving me crazy why it's taking so long to build a 365 foot square foot building but we're getting close now so and and just the investment though that you're making in the lives of each one of those folks is and, just and, what we've talked about how you attack poverty and give folks skills to move up. And that's that's the whole the whole thing because, you know, I was at an event yesterday, you know, that's the thing about, you know, give a man a fish or teach a man mm -hmm. a fish. Right. So, but they, they have an opportunity to get their hands on everything from electricity to water for plumbing, you know, uh, drywall, mm -hmm. concrete. So, you know, they might find a trade that they want to do and that gives them an opportunity. And, you know, you, you see these, um, um, these young men and women, and the women are really like, get out of my way, I want to go to work. You know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I can't follow that up. It's such a slow hanging curve. <laughs> well done, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I never hear get out of the way up here. We never hear that. Not for me. Anyway, and again, just thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, thank Steve. You. Good to see you. Okay, um, moving on to the consent agenda, I do have a citizen who wishes to be heard under item 13, but before I call him up, is there any other items anyone wishes to pull? Yeah, I was going to pull number 11 so that uh, the Human Services Group could highlight some of the things they're doing, but when I, you, know, you get to the rest of the agenda, there's about five or six items that are coming up, so I hope they get a chance to talk briefly about each one of those and, and what we're doing, so I'm not going to pull that one. Okay, so we'll ask you. Um, Move approval. 
what, um, let's have the citizen to be heard oh, first. Oh, first, okay, um, sorry. Yes, uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, agenda item number 13, uh, the corporation Roland um, was in charge of replacing a water pipe on Dunedin Causeway. Um, and I noticed that it took them four years to, to complete the project, uh, one length, one straight shot across to Honeymoon Island there, took them four years, knowing good and well ahead of time that the Dunedin Causeway Bridge was needed to be replaced, um, knowing good and well that the causeway itself may be reconfigured um, to allow proper tidal flow in back of Caladesi Island as it is now. It serves to block tidal flow. Um, and, uh, and, and, and as a result of the new bridge being uh, slated for replacement on the causeway, the one water pipe that took four years, they'll have to replace that water pipe and in effect charging the taxpayers, the residents, again for that. I don't believe they are practicing uh, on a, uh, um, I don't believe they're straight businessmen. I believe they, they work to work to make as much profit as they possibly can, keeping people in the dark on issues. Um, and I don't believe paying twice for doing projects or people that engage in illicit practices should be considered to for contract bidding. Thank you. Okay, thank Madam you. Chair. Yes. I did have a comment on 13 as well. Okay. I just want to give kudos to uh, Barry and Joe and staff for uh, their emphasis on small business enterprise opportunities. And Barry mentioned this in our um, briefing that on this one we had a 5% target and it actually came in at 19%. And so that's 800000 out of a $4 million plus contract that's going to go to, to small businesses. I just wanted to emphasize that and say thank you. That's on item 13. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yeah, you? just really, uh, um, David, appreciate your, your comments, but I just couldn't leave it alone. Um, that uh, The water project that was done out there, we had a, uh, had a leak um, that had to be replaced in its entirety, and the, and, the, and the city decided to replace it on the same side of the causeway. Uh, it took about two years to do, and, um, and, and, and quite frankly, that's where all of, the, all of the utilities were, so it made a lot of sense to combine all utilities on one side. And quite frankly, they're just the contractor. They do the work that they're told to do. And um, so I just, and again, I, you know, appreciate your thoughts and your passion that you bring to the table. But I think on this one, um, they were the, only the builder, not the, not the people that uh, figured out where it's supposed to go. So thank you. Okay. With that, I'll entertain a motion for the consent agenda. So um, approval. Um, motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Welch. I joined. I didn't know. There we go. All right. Okay. Unanimous decision. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item 14. Agenda item 14. Um, commissioners, once again, the airport wishes to defer board item uh, 14 and 15 uh, to the September 24th, 2019 Board of Commissioners meeting. The Federal Aviation Administration did not meet a self-established deadline for issuing the grants as indicated in the report. So we're asking for item 14 and 15 to defer to the next meeting. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by uh, Commissioner Gerard to defer until September 26th. It was 14 and 15. 14 and 15. Correct. Okay, unanimous, unanimous decision. I had agenda item 16. Agenda item 16 is an agreement with Gulf Coast Legal Services to provide legal aid to eligible Pinellas County residents. The agreements for $379,000 on an estimated $253,000 comes from um, court fees. Okay, move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Welch. I think we have a comment. Yeah. Oh, I, just, I just, I was hoping that we could just take a minute and let them just describe what that what is happening here for for, for our residents to at least understand the, the services that we're providing. I think it's 
folks would really like to know uh, where some of their tax dollars are going. Daisy up. And yes. Thank you. Thank you. He's always ready to talk about it. Why don't you start first with um, Agenda 11 sure. that we did on the consent agenda. Afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm Daisy Rodriguez, Director of Human Services. And on uh, consent agenda number 11, those are two SAMHSA grants. Uh, one is for the adult drug, um, uh, I'm sorry, adult, adult drug court project. Um, it's a new grant. It's $140,000 that's prorated. It's actually $2 million over five years that we were able to um, secure. The second grant is um, the Veterans Treatment Court, and that's in its third year. Um, it's they're both perform it's performing well um, that one was uh, the outcomes on that was that it they would treat or engage a hundred veterans over a period of three years and as of February we have engaged 78 out of the hundred so it's it's moving well uh, we did put in a, a grant application for some additional funding to try to offset that when this grant is completed Moving on to item agenda number 16, which is Gulf Coast Legal. So Gulf Coast Legal, we, um, they provide assistance to those uh, households whose income do not exceed 150% of the FPL. Um, they work in conjunction with Bay Area Legal and Community Law Program so that we can expand across the county, providing uh, legal aid services to uh, residents. Thank you. Thank you. We'll vote, and then we'll have you talk about the next few Oh, minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Move approval. Second. Oh, I think we, I think we already had we a motion. We did that second. Yeah. Okay. Um, unanimous decision. Moving on to agenda item 17. Madam Chair, yes. I need to recuse myself from this item. Okay. Item 17 is a uh, alcohol and drug abuse trust fund program rec uh, recommendations to fund nonprofit agencies, and I'll let Daisy speak to it. Yep. So this, these are the recommendations made by the Substance Abuse and Advisory Board. It is for um, seven of the nonprofit agencies listed below, and the expenditures would be for non-recurring expenditures such as equipment and or renovations, and they are listed below for your consideration. <coughs> these come from... Um, Charges, drug related charges, mm -hmm. assessments. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Peters for agenda item 17. You're going to be up here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Gerard recused herself, so other than that, it passed five to um, zero. Uh, agenda item 18. And item 18 is first renewal and first amendment to all cooperative agreements uh, to benefit homeless individuals with Operation PAR, Directions for Living and West Care Gulf Coast. So our CABI program has been in existence for a few years now. It's a SAMHSA grant. And what it is, is for individuals who are recently or newly housed, um, who have a history of chronic homelessness and who have some other behavioral health issues. It's a team that we work with, with PAR, with Directions, and uh, with West Camp. We wrap around those individuals. Once they are housed, the, the referral is made uh, for services, and we wrap around them, provide counseling, we provide um, case management, medication management, et cetera to keep them housed, to give them the tools for sustainability to keep them housed uh, once they, they're in there. And this was a approved decision package for um, 2020. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Welch. Item 18. Okay. And, yeah, that, and, that, and that last one was how, how much was that last one? It was six hundred. Six hundred eighty-three thousand okay. for the year, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, agenda item nineteen is. Um, this is a first option: a renewal agreement with BayCare Home Care for home health care um, for clients in Pinellas County, and this one is for five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. 
Okay, and um, there is a citizen who I think wishes to be heard, Kay Ann Kennedy. Shows you're speaking for and in support. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Kay Ann Kennedy. I'm a student at St. Petersburg College, and I'm in the Public Policy and Administration Program, Baccalaureate Program, and I'm here to speak for agenda number, item number 19. I am in favor of approving the funds for the Pinellas County Health Program, PCHP, and Health Care for the Homeless Program, HCH, that is with Bay Care Home Care Incorporated. I will provide the reasons why. These programs have been effective in providing care and a healthy lifestyle to those in the community who fall through the cracks. Those who are in the category of being in the lowest income bracket or are homeless are many times overlooked and abandoned. However, PCHP and HCH makes it a priority to be a safety net. Imagine for yourself being ill with no means to receive care because of factors that are difficult to control. Isn't so lovely, is it? Everyone deserves care. These programs also lessen emergency room visits by providing primary care physicians. People are more likely to rush to the ER for illnesses treatable by a primary care physician if they do not have one in place. PCHP and HCH educates their clients on how to take care of their health and even provides resources which pushes for long-term wellness routines. Another result is the beneficial outcome for the children of the parents who are in these programs. The parents will see the importance of taking care of their health, which in turn transfers to the children. I recommend that you approve this agenda item for all the benefits PCHP and HCH has for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Very nice. Daisy, you're off the hook on this one. <laughs> So just very briefly then, thank you. She did my work for me today. Um, so this is the contract with Bay Care Home Care, and this is for individuals who are more subacute, so they really don't have to stay in the hospital. Um, we work very closely with the Department of Health on this. There are meetings every other month to look at utilization of the clients and make sure that there's the appropriate level of care. On a weekly basis, the medical director of the Department of Health looks at the referrals to make sure, again, that they're appropriate referrals. Um, and they go into the homes and they provide um, durable medical equipment, infusion therapy, other services that for homebound individuals. Thank you. Move right. approval. Second. second. Do that again. Um, motion by Commissioner Eggers, uh, second by Commissioner Welch. <clears throat> Okay, unanimous decision. Agenda item 20. Agenda item 20 is approval of first option renewal of a, a four, and a fourth amendment to the agreement with Neighborly Care Network to provide uh, additional food and nutrition services through Meals on Wheels. This is a program not to exceed $296,000. So uh, Neighborly Meals on Wheels, you may recall, um, they receive $96,000 through our social action funding currently. Uh, they are receiving $200,000 through the Human Services budget um, to provide meals for homebound seniors ages 60 and, and above, as well as to support their senior congregate dining centers. Move approval. Second. second. <laughs> Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner um, Gerard. And we just received from the Executive Director, David Lamata, some more information, so thank you. Here you are. <laughs> and Commissioner Justice, thank you for your work on this. Appreciate it. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and. Yeah. Okay, agenda item 21. The item 21 is a funding agreement with 211 Tampa Bay Cares for our call center operation. This is a funding amount not to exceed $536,000. And again, this is for, and we've um, supported 211 for, for some years now, and this is for their call center operations. Move approval. Second with a question. Okay. Um, motion by Commissioner um, Gerard, second by Commissioner Welch with a question. Yes. Thank you all for adding the data sheet, which always causes a question or two. 
So on the, um, this is on the metrics report. I don't know if it's, uh, and I see Mickey's here, so you might want to make your way up. And you noted you had a change in your URL and, and database, and that affected some of the numbers. But your, your situation improved after 211 call for June. I don't know which line item you're the, looking at. The I fourth row from the top. In so June. on the very first page? Yeah. Oh, wow. It drops down to 14 percent. So I'm, that situation improved as we are, we've instituted a survey after our calls are ended that goes out to folks that ask them to has, within the first 24 hours about their experience with 2-in-1. And, and then about seven days later, we have an automatic call feature that goes out and ask clients if their situation has improved. Um, we are pleased uh, that it's, you know, increased. We had a few folks, obviously, people are afraid of telemarketers, so when calls are going out to them for answer surveys, they don't pick up the phone. Uh, so I think for that month, we probably didn't have as much. I'd have to look into that number If you could, I know you might not have it with yep. you, but you've yep. been always higher than 70%. Correct. And it goes down to 14, so I didn't know if right. that was a data issue. Okay. The second one was your emails received, which mm -hmm. is in the next section, mm -hmm. has dropped down from 1,500 to... 600 is that we've been pushing our texting trend? instead of okay. emailing us uh, and our online searchable database some of those self-serve uh, which is the overall strategy of reducing wait times in the call center answering okay. calls now texting has dramatically increased well October 18th you were at 12,000 and again you said you had a change in in your infrastructure your URL and you had a footnote on it that talks about something that changed. Mm -hmm. um, online database design and URL changed yes. in May. Mm -hmm. So is that skewing some of the numbers? Correct. Our online database, uh, we did have a, a change. The vendor had a change with that. And so half the month and all those were missing. So we did have a, I don't want to say a hiccup, but th that's what some of the data change for that particular month is about. Do you have a preferred way for folks to contact 211? So obviously, people can always call 201 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, during the days, and especially during the summer, it is extremely busy. That is our high peak season, so you can wait. So we do encourage people to text us. They can text their zip code to 898-211, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, or they can search online. If it's not a pending crisis right now, but they're just doing maybe some research, uh, maybe for a parent and they want to find out some information ahead of time, they can go to our online database and search themselves, which is kind of, obviously, um, we want to save our call center for our most uh, difficult uh, crisis type calls and simpler calls to texting and that. But people do enjoy, if you do text us, uh, the great news is if we do have a hurricane uh, coming, we start blasting text out to people uh, to let them know if there's evacuations or uh, disaster information. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Just one question. Uh -huh. I, I understand that the, the national 1-800-273-8255 number for suicide comes through you all? Correct. We are one of, say, over 200 uh, lifeline uh, prevention, suicide prevention network providers. Uh, so we are one of those centers. So when somebody dials that national number, it does, if it's a 727 area code, it rings into both our center as well into PEMS. And so whoever is most available uh, gets to answer uh, that call. Are these under the, the crisis answer piece here, the metrics? Uh, is that, is that, does that show up in those numbers? Uh, for the Pinellas uh, crisis uh, line, probably, probably not. We do track those separately. Okay, okay. Could you get that to us? Sure. That would be great. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they're in here. I don't know. I was, uh, just didn't see it. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you very Thank much, you so Mickey. Much. Thank you. Appreciate all that you do. Uh, I think we're ready to vote. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, unanimous decision. Moving on to agenda item 22. Agenda item 22 is a section op option of a renewal agreement with personal enrichment through mental health services for crisis stable for the crisis stabilization unit. This for $2.1 million. So moved. Second. Okay. <laughs> Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Gerard. Uh, oh, okay. 
Um, so this is uh, uh, for PEMS and the PICA team, the Pinellas Integrated Care Alliance team. Um, they do integrated case management, working alongside with the PEMS team. Their referrals come from the Sheriff's Mental Health Unit. And these are individuals who are in the community, maybe a little bit more um, stabilized in the community, but still have a lot of um, interaction with law enforcement and uh, Baker Act. So as the referral comes in, the, the team work with those individuals to connect them to services and to make sure that they're making the appropriate referrals, connecting them, but also follow them to make sure that they get to the places that they need to get to. Yeah, I know a couple of people that are going through that very program, and it's been a life saver for them. Right. So it's good stuff. Thank you. Appreciate it. Commissioner, if I can, on you know, this is the last of of, the, of these items for today. But you know, as you can see, there's through your social action funding network that you've provided over the last several years, you've got a tremendous amount of different services mm -hmm. that uh, that help people in need. They're going to try to provide a more of a of a chart and to show the various programs and how the you know they they work and integrate together. And I think it'll make it a little clearer because yeah. there are a lot of programs. And we've been working on that internally, and we're going to be coordinating with marketing and communications to put that on a nice infographic and a, and a flow chart that will be easier to see That'll how all great. of the services work together, interlink together, or not. Right. Good. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you very much for your Yes. Thank you. Your really information. appreciate you and your staff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we need to vote. <laughs> Daisy read my face. I did have a question. You're oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> very sharp insight, <laughs> which I can't see now because our voting block is on the screen. But there's a doing things model. Um, I guess I, I need to vote first, and then I can see it. Okay. So this define, measure, analyze, improve, control model, model is very useful. That's on. Um, Item 19, is that a standard? That is a you standard. do that for every program? That we, we try to do that for every program. If you could program. include that on in the agenda, we'll I found that to yeah. be very helpful. So Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Unanimous decision on that. Um, moving on to agenda item 23. Agenda item 23 is a resolution granting Admiral on uh, tax exemption for a historic property located at 823 10th Avenue in the city of St. Petersburg. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Gerard. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, unanimous decision. Uh, moving on to public works, agenda item 24. Agenda item 24 is um, a local agency program agreement with the Florida Department of Transportation uh, for funding of a sidewalk on Hercules Avenue. $1.4 million. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welch and second. <laughs> Commissioner Justice. Okay. Okay, unanimous decision on that. Uh, agenda item 25. Agenda item 25 is a resolution requesting inclusion of the County Beach Erosion Control Projects and the Florida Beach Management Funding Assistance Program for fiscal year 20 and 21. And this will include Paso Grill Beach region. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Peters. Any questions? Okay. Go ahead and vote. Okay, that is the unanimous decision. Moving on to agenda item 26. Agenda item 26 is a road transfer interlocal agreement with the city of Tarpon Springs uh, for uh, a portion of Lillian Avenue. Madam Chair. Yes. Before we get to that, I just want to thank Mayor Johnson from St. Pete Beach for being here for uh, oh, yes. make sure that we got the job done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Justice, and thank you, Mayor. 26, it's the road transfer and agreement. Is there a motion? Uh, move approval. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Justice. Any questions? Okay. Okay, unanimous decision, moving on to 27. 
Agenda item 27 is fiscal year 2019 board budget amendment four is to realign portions from fire district reserve funds and uh, to programs to the unincorporated fire program within Lar uh, Clearwater, Largo, and Tierra Verde fire district budgets. If there are specific questions, we have Bill Burton. Move approval. Second. A motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Peters. Unanimous decision. Agenda item 28. Item 28 is an annual cert certificate uh, for the Lemon Solid Waste Collection and Disposal Program for non ad valorem ta uh, tax assessment rolls. The current, the current assessment fee equals $16 per month. Move approval. Second. A motion by Commissioner Welch and second by Commissioner Gerard. And I remember many years ago, thank you, Mr. Commissioner Welch, for your leadership. Long time coming. Okay. It has and it has worked well. Okay, unanimous decision on that. Uh, utilities agenda item twenty nine. It's an agreement with uh, Rod Fellas, whatever the name of that is. That's financial consulting. This is for them to develop a uh, policy manual for their water, sewer, and reclaim um, water uh, funds. So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Gerard. Okay, unanimous decision, agenda item 30. And this is a change order number one with TLC diversified for pump station number 18 replacement project. This increases the project by $151,000. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peter, second by Commissioner Welch. Okay, moving on to agenda item 31. That was unanimous. This this is an increase to a to purchasing authorization for Gray Bar Electric Company for electrical lighting, data communication, security projects. So this what is under a um, U.S. Commodities Purchasing Cooperative. This in just increases to where we can buy more product off of this contract. Move mm -hmm. approval. <laughs> that was the jinx. <laughs> All right, I get to pick and choose. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Peters. Okay, unanimous decision on that. Agenda item 32. These are appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Medical Control Board. This is the reappointment of Mr. Jake Fisher, appointment of Jonathan Ashford, reappointment of Stephen Hare, reappointment of Brian Charity, uh, appointment of Jose Barquin, reappointment of Jeremy White, reappointment of Krista Gillis and appointment of Andrea Apple. Just real quick, real real happy to see the um, the Advent Health folks getting somebody on here. So I'm glad to, uh, I met uh, Jose Barquin and good to have him aboard. So that a motion? Yep. <laughs> second. Thank you. Okay, motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Gerard. Okay, that's unanimous decision. Moving on to agenda item 33. Agenda item 33 request adoption of an, the attached new pay plan for all exempt employees under the Board of Commissioners, County Administrator, County Attorney, Business, Tech, Business Technology Services, Human Resources, Human Rights, and Forward Penals. Any Move. questions? Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Gerard. Do you have anything? Okay, that's a unanimous decision. Uh, moving on to agenda item <clears throat> 34. Under item number 34, we're requesting the authority to file suit in the case as referenced on your agenda. This is a case of housing discrimination that was investigated by your Office of Human Rights. Of approval. Second. 
Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Peters. Okay, hey, unanimous decision. Uh, Agenda item 35, County Attorney. Uh, under 35, similarly, we're asking for your authority to file suit in the referenced case. This is another case of housing <coughs> discrimination uh, investigated by your Office of Human Rights. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by um, Commissioner Welch. Okay, that's a unanimous decision. Um, 36, you have county good I, news. I do. I would like to uh, take a moment and let you all know that we have two attorneys in my office who have become recently certified by the Florida Bar as experts in local government law. Uh, Kelly Vicari and Chelsea Hardy on our staff uh, have recently been certified. Uh, that certification is what allows us to uh, hold ourselves out as experts in our area of law, which again is local government law. Uh, the two new certifications have brought us above 50% uh, certification right. in the office. We routinely were above 50% until we had a number of retirements in recent years and had new attorneys uh, replace our very seasoned attorneys. And there is a minimum number of years of practice that you have to meet before you can even apply to become certified. And then you have to go undergo a rigorous peer review uh, and take an examination, which was not a very easy examination, I can tell you. Uh, so congratulations to Kelly and Chelsea. Great, congratulations. Um. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. County Administrator, report on Hurricane Dorian. Well, as you know, um, just two weeks ago, we watched Tropical Storm Dorian strengthen to a Category 5 you know, hurricane, and at one point thought that, you know, the county was really at risk. Um, we hope for the best, but we prepared for the worst. Um, I'm really proud of the staff and the partners and in that preparation. What, one of the things that I can say for sure is that we were ready. Um, you know, and I particularly want to recognize Kathy Perkins for, you know, as our new emergency manager of really stepping up, pulling partners together, and the entire emergency management team and, and really developing a team approach to addressing all of the things that needed to be done in preparation for that. So while um, we were lucky the storm didn't hit us, we wanted to give you a kind of a glimpse of the behind the scenes things that occurred in preparation for that storm. And then to again, recognize all of our employees, our community partners and coming together to have a unified approach to um, being prepared for the storm. The moment forecasters predict that Tampa Bay is in Hurricane Dorian's path, it's go time for Pinellas County staff. We bring in our personnel, we start talking, setting forth our timeline, reviewing what we do with, when we're in the five-day cone. Emergency Management Director Kathy Perkins leads the countywide effort to keep citizens safe. At the Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, the executive leadership group steers the storm response strategy. County staff vacations are canceled and essential personnel are placed on standby for 12-hour shifts. The marketing and communications team notifies residents to finalize preparedness plans. In the Citizens Information Center, staff answer 1,831 phone calls, questions, and concerns. New to the storm response, the county communicates not only by phone, but also by live chat conversations. Public Works and Park staff set up sandbag distribution sites and recheck flood-prone hotspots to clear obstructions. We make sure we come out to these areas that we know um, that would potentially have an issue and attack these areas first to make sure that they're clear and open. With Dorian still approaching and intensifying, the county works with its partners to update plans for best, moderate, and worst case scenarios. No one entity can do everything, um, whether it's police, whether it's fire, EMS, emergency management, you know, we all have to collaborate. That's why we have this giant EOC, so all the partners can come together because it requires all of us to solve problems as they come up. County, school board, and animal services staff prepare to shelter up to 30,000 people and some of their furry family members. We immediately start preparing to get the shelters up and running. We are confident not only in the county staff, but in our school district staff as well, that we are ready. 
to provide the authority needed for county staff to respond to any situation, the Board of County Commissioners calls a special meeting. Today, I'm asking you, to uh, the County Commission, to declare a state of emergency for Pinellas County and delegate the authority to me as your County Administrator to do what is needed to respond to the storm. With resources in place, Pinellas County remains ready until all clear is called. It's really important that we have all hands on deck and the collaboration was just phenomenal. Pinellas County was fortunate to have been spared the impact of this hurricane. Others were not as lucky. If you plan to donate, go to Check a Charity and stay prepared. Hurricane season doesn't end until November 30th. Um, the final thing is, you know, with any um, operation like this, there's always lessons learned. Um, so they'll be preparing an after action review so where we come together and refine our plans and be even better prepared next time. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, we have citizens to be heard. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Watson. Oh, okay. Hi. Hey, uh, thanks for Chuck uh, and Todd. Yeah, I'm Todd. Uh, my father, Chuck. But uh, we own a small family business, Seminole Septic, and I don't think we could have asked a better day to probably have come up here and talk with you guys because, with all this talk about hurricanes and rainwater and storm water and everything like that, uh, you know, we provide pumping services throughout the county as needed. The problem that we have and the reason that we're here is that we dispose of our liquid waste at the Pinellas County um, South Cross. Cross. Yeah, by, but they're, they want to charge us for what our tanks can hold. Our tanks can hold 4,000 gallons, but sometimes residents, they only have 700 gallons at their house that needs to be pumped. So the problem that we're having is that when we go out and we provide the service needed at residential sites, when we bring it to South Cross, we're charged for the capacity of the truck. So um, we're asking that you guys could maybe change the law or change the verbiage in the law to charge us accordingly for the gallons pumped rather than what the capacity of the truck can hold. I'd like to give you an example, if I may. For the last three billing cycles, our actual disposed gallons at South Cross was 7,200 gallons. We were billed for 236,000 gallons. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. I saw your face, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, our, our charge, normally at the, at the going rate of three and a half cents a gallon, would have been $2,667. We were billed by the county $8,260. I don't think that's fair or reasonable. To add, one of the problems that is in the current language is that our trucks are all about $100,000 a piece. So they're expensive pieces of equipment. We use these trucks for dual purposes. We pump out grease traps, typically in the morning before, in the morning time before restaurants get busy for lunch and whatnot. And then after we do our morning rush, then we go out and provide you know, the septic service as, as it comes in. So the current language says that, you know, what, what we would like is we would like for the language to basically say, hey, you can use a dual permitted truck and then we're going to charge you for the gallons that you dispose, not what the tank can hold. My dad actually has a pretty good, it was kind of comical, he says, you know, when you go to the gas station, I mean, if, you're, if your car holds 25 gallons, they don't charge you for 25 gallons, but it's true and we'd like for you guys to take that in consideration. We'll certainly um, take a look at it and um, appreciate you all being here today. Sure, thank you. We just one last request is, um, I'm not sure when the new budget comes into, into play, but we would like this done as, as soon as possible because the, to, to go on paying almost four times what we should is, is, is killing us. All right. We did receive the, I, we, this came in as, as a complaint, and so it's staff is, uh, I did forward it out to staff. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you okay. for the thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And for the service that you provide. Wow, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, Mr. Kenneth um, C., Kenneth Warrington, uh, bus route changes.
don't know if it's true. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for hearing me. Um, one thing about the hurricane, I, I love living here in Pinellas County. It's a wonderful place and appreciate all that you do. Um, and the buses are great. I, best bus systems I've ever ridden on. And, and as far as the hurricane, I, I've been here watching and uh, last few hurricanes. Um, and, and this one, I think a lot of people were praying that the Lord would turn that away from us. And he did and pretty much turned it away from Florida. So I want to thank him for that. I live at Heritage um, Presbyterian Apartments. It's um, half a mile away from Seminole Boulevard. The, the buses um, go back there several times a day, and um, they also stop at Largo Mall. And um, buses have been a lifeline for older people. There's 40 units, 40 buildings, with about 12 units in each, um, and all of us are old folks. I'm one of the few that can walk the half a mile of Seminole Boulevard, and most people can't. There's some changes that uh, eliminating the, the bus route back to us um, also eliminating the stop at um, Dollar Tree, which is very popular for poor folks and old folks, and um, the stop next to, close to uh, Publix, it, it's in walking distance. Um, <coughs> and um, there's, there's some uh, considerations. Um, my, my understanding is um, that the, these will um, cost a little more money and uh, a lot more planning. Um, the, the people I live with um, are basically, they run out of money before they run out of month. And scraping together pennies, nickels, and dimes to get on the buses is, is uh, what uh, they're facing. And like I said, a half a mile, folks can't walk to that. Uh, the, the, the other alternatives, um, I'm not so sure about. And I, I would appreciate if you, you all could uh, use your influence to uh, call a moratorium on, on these changes that are due in October. And uh, not only are um, they changing from coming back to us, but there's stops all along on Seminole Boulevard that, that um, are, they've stopped the bus, uh, they pulled up bus seats and put up signs that on October 8th, there's no more stop there. That's going to cause more walking for older people, and and uh, and I, I feel at risk for for people on foot that are crossing, jaywalking, and and uh, so that's that's all I got, and I appreciate your attention to this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alex Bame. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hey, how are you? This is my second time being here, and uh, first time I was here, I was talking about more like what I problem I had with the property that I purchased, me and my wife. And now I'm here again for the same thing, but I kind of want to be the example today. You know, I'm not here to more cry about my problem because I, I knew what I was getting into before I bought the property. Now I'm just more as an example as what I'm going through with the county, trying to get lot clearing liens and uh, and you know magistrate liens, and I want to show you, show you guys how I purchased it and what I've done today. See where the seal is? If you want to show us any pictures, you can just yeah, put it yeah, right on the seal. So towards you. I mean, just as you would see it on the seal. Yeah, right here. Yeah, any photo, just put it on the seal. When I purchased the property, it was almost a year ago, and I purchased it with hoping that the county would work with me and hopefully we could clear this property up as it was been abandoned for 10 years and a complete disaster. And, and people live next to this property, neighbors. And they're so happy that we bought it and we cleaned it up. But let me just show you of how this property was when we first purchased it. This is one of them when we first bought it. This is not a very good picture, but just to give you an idea of how terrible this was. Um, you know, with the, with the lot, with the grass, everything growing. And again, we have lot clearing liens as the county went there, uh, has contractors to clean up this property. Again, this is what they cleaned up. To me, that doesn't look cleaned up. And I also have receipts of dump uh, fees that I've dumped with the dump trailer that I've had to run it myself to take all this trash out of this property. And again, there's million dollar liens on this property that I still can't work around it 
to even come to a negotiated so we can maybe put a home on this property and make it livable again. At the rate that it's going, this property like this, it will never be livable. And it was like this for 10, more than 10 years like this. And county did absolutely nothing. And a guy like me comes in there with my wife and we do our best, we clean it up. And we still cannot work with the county to get the lot clearing liens and come to a negotiation of what we could pay uh, to be done with. They want an extremely uh, high number for what the property is worth. I'm not looking for a handout. I've already put more than what the property is worth out of my pocket. And if you don't believe me, this is, that's me in the picture, cleaning up. I have a lot more, and I don't want to waste you, your, your guys' time. But I just want to make a, an example of, you know, I was told that, hey, these are taxpayers' money that you have to pay back for the lot clearing liens because the county spent money on cleaning up this lot, right? I'm the taxpayer. The neighbors there are the taxpayers. This is not cleaned. This is how I bought it. And I've even had to scrape up dirt because there was so much trash in the dirt. This is how this looks today. There was drug addicts living, would live inside, under the bush, on this property. The people walking across it. Uh, kids going to school, walking across this property because it's a corner lot to catch the bus. I cleaned it up. I even put a fence to prevent from kids walking through because there's so much glass on the property. And if you don't believe me, okay. this is you, a picture. You're past uh, um, almost three and a half minutes. You're past your time. If you could wrap it up, oh, please. Thank you. Thanks for your concern. Th this is what the things I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. And this is not my first time being here. This is my second time. And Officer Parker is our uh, officer for the code violation or code officers at our property that we own. I haven't gotten any help from anybody or the county. This is why I'm here. So if you guys can do something about these kind of things so people like me could have a, you know, a chance to do something with these properties. I can't pay a million dollars in liens. Mm -hmm. If I could, but you're I looking for us to excuse the liens so that are on the no, property? No, I need... I, I haven't even got a chance. I even wrote a, 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 a letter saying, you know, so we can come to a negotiation about the, the liens. I completely got shut down. I, was, I keep being brought in circles. We even called to speak with, with our commissioner, and we never, we never got on the phone. And this has been going on for a year now. Where's the property located? What's that? Where is it located? Clearwater. Is it the one that's listed on your card? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's well, stop contact you. So, I just want to be an example okay. of what I'm going through and, and other people like me going through. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Good afternoon again, Commissioners. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Here's the liberty and freedom and the drink of happiness. And when it's all consumed, we'll soon see what our founding fathers were selling us. The sellers of the dram, recognized as a political tactic in Abraham Lincoln's temperance address, as a personal and individual motive of men and government selling us something other than what they originally brought forth and professed themselves to be acting upon, tabling, selling the political, the constitutional libation of deception, happiness, and the liberty of hiding a bad motive served up under the candid nature of an artificial government using legislative pretentiousness, slowly, spiritually intent on creating a state of perfidy and disrepair as declared, giving rise to an unjust, unwarranted, constitutionally counterfeit, de facto, despotic form of political power over water. As I read it, our founding fathers are the authors of moral pestilence, misery, vice, dissension, overarching crimes in the land, constitutionally incapable of being honest, standing us on our heads, egregious apostles of sin, selling us on our own future desecration, constituted as a peacetime ship of war, 
in Article 1, Section 10, in time and measure, declaring when in the course of human events constituted for its posterity, its rectitude, its intent, selling us on the dram as an instrument, as a process to counterfeit a constitutionally invective, backbiting outcome, serving up deception as a rapacious mode to a means, tabling betrayal as an ignominious means used to conquer and the sewage borne by it, slowly consigning those who you are candidly pretending to govern, deceptively laying us to waste. The manifest meanness of the thing, taking liberty, property, and life, and the religion of Christianity, birthing water jurisdictions under the variance of the 14th Amendment. So here's to today's liberty, freedom, and happiness at the cost of tomorrow's health, safety, and welfare. Here's to the egregious apostles of sin, the things of denunciation, senselessness, misery, vice, and non-rational causes. Here's to abomination and the, the blood-sucking genius of it all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of the cards that I have for public comment. I will move on to uh, agenda item 39. Or appointments to this um, Greater Seminole Area Special Recreation District. Um, we have um, one appointment open. And that would be John Beal. Move approval. Yeah, I Second. didn't pull it up quick enough. I heard a motion by Commissioner Justice. A second, second over here. By Commissioner Peters. Okay, unanimous decision. Moving on to appointment, reappointment to the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority. Um, both Commissioner Pat Gerard and Charlie Justice's terms expire September 30th, 2019. Um, so we need, I you all are both willing to Second. serve? Third. Second. <laughs> I said I moved to reappoint <laughs> and I Commissioner of Justice and Commissioner Gerard. Wholeheartedly this, support. Madam Chair, I assume this is will be part of the discussion that whoever is the next chair will take into consideration as there is a global view of all the committee assignments for 2020 and beyond. As we typically, typically do, do every year. Okay. But it, this must be something that PSTA is requiring us to do. Yeah. Right. right. So, okay. Well, in that case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Commissioner Peters um, was the f motion maker and Commissioner Welch was the seconder. Okay, um, thank you very much. Unanimous decision. Um, County Commission new business items. Does anybody have any new business items? Uh, we'll move to the County Commission Board Reports and Miscellaneous. I will start with um, Commissioner Eggers. Thank you. I thought there was a, a thing or two you were bringing forward. Is I'm going to bring it up under my... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. Um, okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just have a couple of things. Uh, talking specifically about Forward Pinellas, we had a meeting yesterday um, and uh, it had, had a lot of issues that we talked about and and, and dealt with, but one of the things that we focused on a little bit was our long-range uh, tr transportation plan. That's the 2045 plan, and one of the aspects of this plan is uh, that's different than previous plans is that we're really looking at the land use component as a part of that long-range plan, and we're also looking at the transit piece. And so yesterday we had a, a nice update about um, the um, um, I guess that the plan that we're talking about, adapt, build, and connect, and uh, the, the survey specifically, I just wanted to just touch base on the survey if I can find it here. I may not be able to find it now that I've moved away from the results. Hold on. Yeah, lost it. Uh oh. I'll get back to that one, and hopefully I'll be able to. Here, hold on one second. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, and so there was, there's been a lot going on in the last couple of years talking about the technical aspects and public engagement of that plan. And 
and I know that there's a lot of work going on between the, um, uh, Barry's office and and um, and PSTA's uh, and, and the MPO uh, talking about where we are with transportation planning and transportation uh, transit issues going forward, and. Uh, it was just really interesting. The survey there was a there was a survey done, and we had uh, let's see, uh, 4,800 participants, and another 5,000 commented, um, 171,000 data points that we got over the course of about a year, um, and then the latest latest survey was done over the summer, and um, the results were just, I mean, it's just really good that we're getting that kind of input and getting those kind of results, um, and so. As we, you know, just some just some really brief summary thoughts that came to came to the table, with uh, uh, it was ranked one through five, five being the the most pro uh, aspect of it, and one being the, the the most negative, and then, you know, and three being kind of neutral. So when they talked about things that were uh, specific components of it in the bicycle pedestrian area, trails ranked extremely high. No surprise to anybody. Um, enhanced crosswalks rated very high as well. Uh, protected bike lanes uh, did well and sidewalks did well as also. Bike lanes themselves did not do nearly as well as the protected bike lanes and there were some different issues as they drilled into it. I don't really want to get into the details here but um, still a lot of support for trails and um, the discussion about closing the loop in Pinellas County and we're working on that obviously and then some of the cross county um, trails that, that are emerging. So uh, really a good, uh, good, uh, robust conversation there. And those numbers, when you combined all of it, were in the, into the three and 4,000 numbers out of the five that responded. Um, on bus service, um, not quite as much excitement um, in that arena. The numbers on the high end were uh, somewhere in the 1,200 range. Um, so maybe not as much excitement about it, but we have a a, a bus system that's not that robust, um, to say the least, and um, but a lot of a lot of uh, positive uh, feelings about more weekend bus service, more frequent bus service, and some late night bus service, which we're really trying to uh, put into play. Not as much excitement about dedicated bus lanes. So um, whether uh, folks are educated up on it um, and don't like it, or there's still some education work to do there. Um, that's you know still yet to, to come. Um, emerging solutions, uh, some of the things that, that are out there that people were very in support of, um, improved and more traffic signal timing, which should be of no big surprise, but um, improved and more. And I think that's something that we continue to look at, changing the software and adding more areas uh, for that. So that was overwhelmingly supported. Uh, waterborne transit uh, was also supported, um, uh, as was elevated transit. Interesting. The numbers weren't quite as high, but the support was there for it. Um, what wasn't supported too much was automated automated vehicles, because I think people are really still perplexed as to how it's going to work for them, how it could possibly work. But and the other was mo micro mobility scooters. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, we're going to be seeing a lot of those. Uh, and what I'm understanding is there's a I'm not quite sure what um, what control we have over them on our trails, um, but I understand there's little control we have on the trails yeah, of our county. So I want to perhaps look into that a little bit. Um, and then um, there was there was support, there was uh, support for regional rail service. I think the the over the overwhelming piece of that was really the. The, the, the line the, the line that's coming up from south of the south of the state coming across to Orlando and then perhaps hopefully coming into Tampa there's a lot of folks talking about that and how we might plug in how we might get it over here um, so that was um, that was good and then um, then I and then the, the other thing that uh, we talked about our current street and highways maintaining the existing roads obviously very high intersection work again high interchanges uh, not so well on toll roads or widening the existing roads. So not that we have a lot of extra uh, right-of-way to buy anyway for widening, but people don't want to see more widening of roads. So, um, but anyway, it was just, it was just uh, some good information. I think the, uh, the Oregon MPO, our forward Pinellas group, is doing really good work to get out there and get folks', in, folks input. And so that will become part of our long-range plan that will be approved 
um, in November. Yes. Maybe you could send those um, mm -hmm. graphics out to us. Okay, we'll do that. Kim, are you listening? Um, anyway, uh, so then I just have a couple of other things real quick. Um, um, I know that the uh, there's others that will talk about PSTA, but uh, the gentleman that came and was talking about his neighborhood, I know that several folks, I don't know if he's still here. Yeah. Yes. Several folks had come to PSTA on, on your neighborhood's behalf, and that's the group that really would make those kinds of decisions. Um, three of us are there on that board, and we express some concerns to our staff there. And supposedly, they told us they're working on a solution to help folks get to the bus stop from way back in the community, which, where it is a long walk. So, um, But PSTA is the, the board that uh, some of your cohorts went to and have started to get the ball rolling. So stay tuned. Hopefully we'll start solving some of those issues. But don't hesitate to come to that PSTA board meeting and, and let us know uh, in the future. <coughs> in, my, in my VA community, which I belong to, I just really just real quickly, I, haven't, I don't know that I've done this before, but I just really wanted to read um, what I consider the purpose of that group. It's just three things. Four things. Create direct and open lines of communication within the community to serve as an early warning system and enable local responsiveness to veteran issues. Two, create forums where public and private efforts can learn about each other and work together to enhance the effectiveness and improve veteran outcomes. Three, improve veteran outcomes by connecting public and private resources and capabilities. And lastly, enable veterans to easily identify and reach all the resources available to them voice their opinions, and provide valuable input. And just really wanted to, to say that uh, I think the board is doing some really amazing work. And one of these days, I hope we can bring them in for um, a, a short presentation. Uh, no Tampa Bay Water executive meeting this month. Um, the TMA, we had a little discussion. I'd say the highlight there is that we had uh, Senator Roussan there, and he was able to at least engage us in some conversation about the state's thoughts about uh, MPOs, uh, about transport transit in the area. Um, and so the, the takeaway from all of that is that we're going to try to have one of those officials at uh, each of our meetings. So that it's better, I think it'll be better connect connection uh, to the uh, to Tallahassee folks. Um, let's see, Pinell School Collaborative is next month. And uh, just had a couple personal comments, no, no big deal. I just, I wanted to, to thank Commissioner Peters for the incredible effort her and uh, your office has done on the on the YAC effort and, and getting folks interested. I just really wonderful and um, looking forward to how we bring that in for a landing. But thank you for that effort. Um, CNCN, which is a county of North County neighborhoods, has a transportation forum this Monday at uh, seven o'clock at the Harbor Hall in downtown Palm Harbor to talk about. I think uh, Barry's going to be there talking, so get a chance to meet our county administrator and, and hear him talk about many of the different uh, transportation projects that are going on. Um, and just uh, two things uh, left. Um, one is I wanted to commend Community Health Centers of Pinellas County. Uh, they're a nonprofit federally qualified health center that has 13 health centers in our county have been recognized nationally from a national, uh, all of them across the country as one of the top seven most cost efficient ones in the country, right here in our own in our own backyard. And so I really wanted to commend the, the management team and all the folks that uh, bring health services to the residents of Pinellas County. And then finally, I just wanted to, uh, I'm sure there'll be other opportunities for this, but to thank uh, Clarissa for an amazing career here and uh, her 26 years of service to the county. and and wish you so much happiness and good health in the next phase of, uh, of your life after you retire. What day? September 27th. Oh, it's coming around the corner. <laughs> thank you, Clarissa, and thank, thank you, you for the extended time. Appreciate it. Commissioner Gerard. Okay. Um, C-SPIN board's working on uh, an RFP for a new uh, legal firm. Um, and I have some questions, yes. Wow. <laughs> the final piece of the puzzle, I think. Um, let's see, JDAI hadn't had a meeting in a while, but they're still trying to increase utilization of the Evening Reporting Center. Mm -hmm. We've been working on that for a year and a half, um, with no solutions yet, by the way. 
uh, Child Care License Board met last night, had um, many, many changes to the regulations for both uh, family daycare homes and uh, centers. And I think it's amazing that if you ever looked at the regs for the child care centers, it's mind blowing. And so that there had to be at least 100 changes just this year. Gosh, little silly things, you know. But they do a great job of communicating that out. And we go beyond those standards even in Pinellas County still. Um, so God bless anybody that has a daycare home or a center. It's incredible that you can even meet all those standards or remember them all at once. Um, Public Safety Coordinating Council met. Um, we had a presentation on how drugs are getting into the country and basically which drugs come from where. Very, very interesting. And I wanted to thank Deborah Berry for always lining up uh, interesting presentations for that group. I don't know where she gets them, but it's, a, it's kind of a fun thing. And also, I just as an issue, I'd like to talk about the thing about property liens and you know, new owners of properties and what kind of forgiveness program do we have, if any? And because I think it's a discouraging sort of thing or counterproductive <clears throat> to make the next owner pay amazing levels of fines. I mean, in fact, we have one right now who's wanting to do affordable housing and has a $2 million barrier from the previous owner. So it's like, what, what are we doing? You know, are we ever going to get that money in the first place? And do we want to see properties redeveloped or not? You know, so I'd like to have a discussion about that. Okay. I think that's, um, I, Barry did let me know that they had, um, that Blake had tried to meet with you all several times to talk about the liens, but this probably needs to be a wider discussion by us policy issue yeah the, his hands are probably tied this far <laughs> yeah. um and that kind of very and i haven't finished this discussion but recently um someone came to meet with me and he purchased a home where the previous owners and everyone on the block let the swales the drainage swales all fill in and so they are now having flooding in the neighborhood because, Surprise. and this guy says, I just bought the house and I was already told and you know, that I have to go put in swales. And I drove out, looked at the property and it's gonna be a pretty difficult thing to accomplish. So, um, you know, so I think we have a lot of different things that, you know, homeowners encounter that we have to maybe have a discussion about, but I'm. But we have to be careful because we have to, you know, be mindful of using taxpayer money on private property. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but. and we've had some situations where new homes are being built under new codes, next to older homes, or elevated. Right. And right. and, and right. It, all of a sudden they're getting a lot of the runoff, even though it's supposed to be taken care of in some way. Um, and we've got to figure that out too, and I'm not sure what the answers are there, but it does create problems for for neighbors, and and we want it. We want to encourage that next generation to you know, lift them up a little bit. But boy, in the meantime, right. we talked about that with uh, the uh, mobile home park. Remember that, where that'll be coming, like right. you know where you have these. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's more. There's more there. Yeah. Um, but we certainly are going to bring that back to to you for a discussion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Barry and I have also talked about, you know, dredging. So, you know, where all of these almost fit into that item or that pool of, you know, what should we be doing or not doing? Yeah. Yeah. And what kind of precedent does it set? Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, anything else, Commissioner Gerard? Okay. Very good. Um, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Homeless Leadership Board, uh, PSTA, and Tampa Bay Estuary are all in various stages of either passing or going through the stages of passing our annual budgets. Um, so those will come in for a landing pretty soon. Um, that's really all I have as far as our committees. Um, with the estuary program, I was uh, happy to attend with uh, our director, Mr. Sherwood. Uh, it was announced that the Florida Gulf Coast is a Mission Blue Hope Spot. Uh, 
Mission Blue is a worldwide organization led by Dr. Sylvia Earle, uh, who was the first woman leader of NOAA, if you didn't know, but uh, just as important, she grew up in Dunedin, Florida, mm -hmm. and um, uh, has had a remarkable career in leading this organization. But by designating the Gulf Coast as a Mission Blue Hope Spot, it brings a lot of attention and focus to the partnerships that part of some a lot of us have worked to create to continue to improve the quality of the Gulf Coast and the estuary program. So we're excited about that. Uh, had an opportunity last week to attend a uh, event with called Whiskey and War Stories, which was a uh, event to support Rise St. Pete, which is a um, organization working to install a beam from the World Trade Center at the Warehouse Arts District in St. Petersburg. Uh, and the fundraiser that night had a uh, guest speaker, Scott Neal, who is one of the 12 horse soldiers first into Afghanistan after 9-11. Uh, he and some of his uh, retired cohorts have started the American Freedom Distillery and is already producing world record breaking uh, bourbon and uh, we'll have a tasting room in St. Petersburg coming soon. So uh, that's exciting news for us. Um, several of us had the opportunity to attend the um, Remember Honor Support event Wednesday. Wanted to congratulate Joe Brower, the uh, great organization. Huge event, huge uh, turnout there, special event. They've raised nearly $600,000 to give back to community organizations since their inception just six years ago. So uh, they're doing a lot of great work. And then just the last thing is to save the date. October 11th is our next farm chair, and we'll get you more details on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure, Peters. You want to take this and pass this down? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, you know, there's a couple of people I really want to thank. Um, the Reddington Long Pier, we don't talk about it much, but it's a big issue, especially in that area. And with hurricane season coming, it has fallen apart in the last storm, um, and it's continuing to degrade. But the question was, who's responsible? And uh, I'll tell you, Jewel and, uh, you know, the county attorney's office seldom gets accolades. So bravo to you guys. You worked really, really hard, um, and especially Jared and Brandon, in driving the bus to find out who's responsible. So it's finally been determined that the state of Florida is responsible, and they do have the ability to demo the bridge or the pier. And uh, we don't have a timeline for when they will do that, but at least we now have clarity on, on who has the ability and the right to do that. So... Um, I just want to, you know, con congratulate you guys for doing really good work, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Hopefully we'll get on them and, and maybe urge them a little stronger to start demoing sooner before another storm comes. Um, you know, Barry and Lourdes all did an outstanding job with Hurricane Dorian, so thank you so much. Gratefully, you know, we, we dodged a bullet on that one, but um, first time out, you did really good, so at least I was told, so <laughs> congratulations to you guys. Um, and I also want to thank Kelly Levy and her team because uh, they presented to a small group at Terra Verde about the modeling and the research that we've done in Shell Key. And uh, for the first time in many years, um, the people that were in the room really felt satisfied that the county is really doing good work. And, and it was really amazing. So the biggest naysayers kind of felt really, really good. So she did a really outstanding job and her team and the data that will be presented. I'm looking forward to see the final report, but um, it was really, really a good job. So I just wanted to shout out to them. Um, our, our staff work really, really hard, and so I just want to recognize them when, when I notice it. Um, the YAC applicants, we got 32 applicants. We can only have 25. Um, so we have the horrible job of picking some that can't participate, which we're kind of sad about that. Um, however, you will uh, vote on them on September 24th. So Cal uh, Ashley will send out all of their resumes and applications for you all to review. Um, and you can go through the painstaking process of picking out 25 or 32. So um, anyways, they all were really great. And I think that open house turned out really, really nice. I want to thank the staff in the media room. They did a really great job and gave them a tour and kind of highlighted a lot of what goes on here. So, um, so thank you to them as well. Um, also, um, I, I'm passed out. I was at the, the fusion meeting today, and you know, I'm always going to give an opportunity to present this to you. The, the first graph that you all are going to see, that you see in what I passed out to you, the, the red bar is only 11 months of this fiscal year, so we have another month to report. Um, and if you take a look, fiscal year 10 and 11, uh, fiscal year 10 is when you all did the pill mill ban. And then in 11, you had to redo that ban because um, people got creative on how to get around your language. So we were at a real crisis back in 2011. And if you take a look at 2018-19, um, I, I just kind of want to know, want you all to know where we're at. 
Um, to me, that, that bar looks like we've got another crisis coming. And I know we're working on it, and I know we're doing good things, but I just want you to be aware, because I don't think it's really being talked about enough. Um, the second page of that graph is, I thought was very important, and what is on the round circles, and I suppose I should have Ashley put this up, um, what's on the round circles are the zip codes. And you've got four years of where our 911 calls are going in zip codes. And so if you just look at the right side of that, uh, where the big wide bar is, um, uh, 33713, 33714, it's easier to see that one. That's why I picked it out. But you can see the blue line was um, fiscal 1516, I believe, and then the, the red line. And you can see how it's continuing in the same neighborhoods and the same zip codes getting worse and getting worse and getting worse and getting worse. So so we know where to target, and this group is doing a great job. I can tell you our undercover officers in the police department and the sheriff are getting really creative, and they're talking together, and they're coming up with strategies on stopping what's coming in. But I just thought it was worth um, showing you all. You can see where the transports are coming from on the third page. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, you expect the big cities to have big numbers but great based on population. Um, but... Um, I just, I just thought it was worth, you know, this is fresh off the press this morning, um, and I thought it was worth sharing with all of you just the numbers. Um, to me, it's very sobering, and um, I, I really think that uh, Barry and his team have got a good plan on how to, you know, how we can use data to uh, attack this and use an approach on it. So I'm looking forward to uh, the, 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 the um, RFIs and, and the work that they've sent out already. So I just wanted to keep you updated. So thanks for indulging me. Um, lastly, um, I will miss our meeting next week. Um, uh, the Gates Foundation and the National Association of Counties is having their next meeting in Minneapolis. So I'll be in Minneapolis next week. Um, I'm looking forward to what we'll be looking at. It's mostly uh, poverty and, and how you can move people out of poverty is going to be the topic next week in, in Minneapolis, and I'll report that when I come back. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Commissioner Welch. Thank you. That's interesting. I'm, I'll be in, in Minneapolis as well. St. Paulo. No, Minneapolis. Yeah, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll be in. Chamber. They're having yeah. a benchmarking uh, yeah. trip um, next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Right. So, cool. I've got their agenda. Are you, um, so on the YAC, again, thank you for the great job you're doing there. Are you uh, set on 25 as a manageable number, or would you be okay with 32? Because I remember we had this problem <laughs> before, and we just increased the number. So is it a, is it a management issue? Or? So I believe in your ordinance it says 25, so that's kind of the rule. And if you want, I know if you and Ashley's going to handle a lot of this. And uh, if it were up to me, I would take every single one of them. The question is, how do we manage them when we do the tour? Can we manage 32 or 33 of them? Um, well, I was going to say, um, Ashley Elmer from Commissioner Peter's office, um, we got to meet the big applicants at the when they came out a couple weeks ago. Commissioner Eggers, thank you for helping and speaking to the kids as well. Um, Commissioner Peters and I have toured many departments of the county in the last eight or nine months, and I can't imagine 32 kids behind me in those tours. So um, for the for the quality um, of the program. So it's a management issue, the number of, okay. I would say so, yeah. All right, thank you. Can I um, just say something about sure. that thing? Expect some drop off. Well, and and I expect okay. some drop offs. And so, so we've been wrestling with that because I suspect we'd lose two to four um, in the year. And I don't know if that's what you experienced, is about two to four, is there more? Probably more. Probably more. Um, you know, we're hoping to have real quality opportunities so that maybe they won't drop off, but I do expect some drop off. Um, and so, you know, if you all want to, you know, lean towards more, I'm going to, I'll be open to that. You know, me more the merrier. I just know it will be more challenging um, with logistics when we get every one of them to show up. But I do know that they all won't show up at every single meeting. So, yeah, um, I think they sometimes they sign up and then they don't realize how busy they're going to be during the school year. Yeah. And so they end up not being able to do it. But, yeah. Do you know offhand how many are returning versus are there any freshmen in this? There's three returning. Only three. They so the they all would be there. freshmen. Um, the vast majority are 10th grade. Okay. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I just wanted to take my hat off to the to the work you guys have done to get that number. Um, yeah, I would almost like to. I, you know, it's, it's so you know, we work so hard to get people interested in this program or any any getting engaged in government for crying out loud and. And then when they do, it's like we tell them, well, we just don't have spot. So, I mean, even if we came to a point where we could call, you know, them all alternates, the ones that aren't picked, and then there is going to be some drop off and you just start, you know, adding them in. I mean, I would suspect out of 32, you're probably going to lose five or six. But I'm not trying to be negative about it. It's just kind of normal. So, um, yeah. and so you probably have just the right number, you know, but... Maybe we could do that. We could identify as alternates. I don't know if the ordinance keeps us from doing that, but, you know. My, my handy helper out in the audience has emailed me <laughs> your resolution, and it looks oh, like resolution. just back in. It's done by resolution, and it looks like just back in 2014, um, you increased the limit from 15 to 25. So, I mean, it looks like there, if, if this is a potential trend, it looks like it has been trending up, you all could easily change this if you wanted to, okay. or talk in terms of alternate, but it looks like it would be something much easier to modify than an ordinance would be. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Don. So when does that come to us? Uh, September 24th. All right. Thank you. Sure. I just, I don't know how you say no to one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you, you know. But you're going to have all the extra work, so I'll, I'll leave Good you. one year, we had like 40. So I just want to thank, um, so if I can get my work. technology working, no comment, Commissioner Justice. I want to thank Commissioner Peters for arranging us for us to attend the 9-11 breakfast yesterday, the Remember, Honor, Support. That was uh, a great breakfast, and it's just as Commissioner Egger said, it reminded us of what we're supposed to be as a nation. Um, for Pinellas, I want to thank you for an efficient meeting, Commissioner Eggers, <laughs> thank uh, yesterday. You. It was interesting as we came out of that meeting, though, you may have seen the Wallet Hub survey of uh, the top 100 cities in America in terms of transportation services, and Tampa St. Pete came in 98th and 99th yeah. out of 100. That came out yesterday after our meeting, and that was based on accessibility convenience, safety, reliability, and resources. So that takes us right to the conversation we'll have soon about jobs, housing, transportation, how they all tie together. And we did talk about that yesterday as well. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation. I know, Barry, you've done a lot of work uh, with PSTA and with Ford Pinellas on that and listening to our partners throughout the county. So thank you for the work you've been doing there. Uh, this morning, the FAC uh, Finance and Audit Committee met. We approved next year's budget, uh, $5 million budget. Uh, all the trends are positive uh, there. And we do have a $1 million commitment in reserves for um, addressing policy issues, and, and we should have received our allocation um, from FAC. Barry, so I'd like to get an update on where we are on that. Okay. Okay. Look. Um, future meetings, the Creative Pinellas Board will have a retreat this Friday. It'll be my first retreat with Creative Pinellas. Looking forward to that. Uh, our complete count uh, subcommittees have been meeting, and we'll have a full complete count uh, committee meeting on September 25th at the Epicenter. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And some final thank yous. Uh, those of you who are my Facebook friends know that last Friday I uh, had some excitement in my neighborhood, unfortunately. Um, down by the St. Pete Country Club, saw some cars racing through the neighborhood, and not five minutes later, the suspects were caught two blocks away. Uh, Claritha is a neighbor of mine, so she may have seen some of this. Uh, one of the cars ended up in a pond uh, on the golf course. Again, stolen cars, uh, the auto theft issue that we've seen. But the Violent Crime Task Force are the officers that apprehended the suspects. I had a chance to talk with some of those deputies, and they did a fantastic job. Uh, so I just want to thank them for the job they're doing. Um, Barry and Kathy and your team, I know Kathy had to leave. Um, Y'all did a fantastic job. Um, you, now you have a Florida hurricane under your belt as administrator. Yep. <laughs> that was quick. Um, so congratulations. Practice run. <laughs> well, there is a... a I just watched Charlie Justice's Facebook feed. He tells us what's coming. So right. apparently there's another one heading our way. A, a, what is it at this point, Dina? Not even a depression? It's a thing. Okay. It's a thing. It's a thing out there. Okay. <laughs> I'll get yeah, technical. It's a number. 
Uh, and I um, wanted to thank Commissioner Eggers again for your words of inspiration yesterday at Fort Pinellas. Thank and you. thank you, Madam Chair, for having him repeat that today. I think it was very appropriate. And finally, to Claritha, um, is this your last meeting with us? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I, I echo Commissioner Eggers. You've just been the very example of public service. You've been here since the day I came on board uh, 19 years ago. And um, just outstanding professionalism, stewardship, uh, and a, a calm and collaborative spirit, right. always. Mm -hmm. And Thank and you. your leadership on huge issues like Opus. You're not leaving just so you don't have to do the next Opus, I'm sure. <laughs> no, that has nothing <laughs> to do with it. <laughs> But, but just a great job. You will be missed, but I just want to thank you for being the example of public service, Clarita. It's been an honor to work with you. Thank you very much. It's been my honor and privilege to work here for 26 years. Awesome job. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I um, went over and mentioned to Clarita I have a little something for her, but I'm doing it at the 6 o'clock meeting. Okay. So, awesome. Yep. Um, Question yes. for Ken. Um, on the, um, the census work that's going to be mm -hmm. uh, starting and then and completed, we had some, seems like we had some um, items that we voted on in the, in the last election or a refer that we're going to need some work after the next census. And, like, I don't, I don't remember what it was. Was it redistricting um, or... So, or is that just something that's naturally done? It's always it, done. Yeah, that, that happens after every census. But it seemed like there was one or two items that, that were that were that we'll, we're going to wait and deal with that after the. Uh, it comes this. back to you. Like, yeah, you know, I will. I'll try to. Exactly. I'll try to find that and send it to you. Mine well, that, like I, a steel I, trap here. <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> well, that gives me an opportunity, Madam Chair. If I could, I just um, want to thank Corey Gray from planning and Josh Boatwright from marketing communications for the great job they've done uh, moving us thus far. We do have a website, PinellasCounty.org slash 2020 census. You can see all the subcommittees, uh, questions about the census. It will be uh, digital first, so folks will get something in the mail and they'll be directed to an online site to complete the census. If they're not comfortable with that, they'll be mail and then finally folks in person uh, going door to door, but it'll be di digital first, and that's a first for our census in America. So, looking forward to it. That'll be in March. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you for your work on that. Okay, um, I just want to give you a brief update on um, if someone can put these on for everybody to see. This is the um, Tourist Development Council, and thank you. That one's the main one, and then this will be second. And um, I, our meeting, um, August 21st, we had Tampa International uh, present. And um, from 2010 to 2019, their international flights have increased 157%. So that's really great news. Their airport produces $3 billion in tax revenues. And that equates to saving the taxpayer about 15, that's not, written. Oh. I'll oh. talk about this in a minute. $1,500 per taxpayer. Um, they're looking at and working on possible new air service. Not yet. You can... <laughs> Sorry. Um, to Bogota, Mexico City, Lima, Manchester, and Dublin. So um, the airport's doing exceedingly well, and um, so it was a very interesting meeting. But what I wanted to show you is this is the first time ever they're starting to compile this information and you can see of the other major tourism counties we did collections um, we are number two wow. in the state of Florida so um, I and you can see we also had a, a very nice change then okay I'm ready for the second sorry <laughs> I should have started with this first right okay then this was um, the last recorded uh, collections for bed tax and you can see that we continue to do well over last year. So I just wanted to give you a brief report since I really hadn't done that for a while mm -hmm. from the Tourist Development Council. Um, we also had an elite, um, excuse me, a capital project funding program committee meeting and uh, the committee reviewed Tampa Bay Watch, St. Petersburg Museum of History and the Dali Museum and those recommendations will be coming to us as the county commission um, at a future board meeting. But they all went over the 700 average. 
Okay, yes. Just had a quick question on that first slide that you had that showed um, it looked like for the state of Florida decline. Was there any it comments did. made on that? Any any thoughts as um, to not and how it, that compared to the year? Some before? of it, you know, it was really due to the panhandle and mm -hmm. you know the leftover from Michael, the mm -hmm. hurricane. Um, Dana Young did also come to the meeting and did a very nice presentation about the partnerships and everything that they are doing at um, Visit Florida. So um, they, um, she's putting in more Google DMO services um, and wanted to ask, their focus is on digital, social, and familiarization trips. So that's what she's honing in on as far as the future for Visit Florida. Um, they Their marketing programs are kind of in different um, ideas, but mostly, you know, like adventure or winter time or experience, and they're trying to highlight some ecotourism stuff too and really encourage people to um, to try different things throughout the state of Florida. Yeah, I was at the Orlando airport for a conference, and when you come from the parking inside, both of the big major entry areas has a big wall of our beaches right there so people come in to visit you know do the Disney and all of the uh -huh. that stuff if there's a choice if you go west you know, neat that was that well done it was a nice piece to see I'm glad that you saw that um, it, it's been mentioned by um, some of the other hoteliers that are on the tourist development council how strong the Orlando market has become mm -hmm. even more so so we are concentrating more efforts on that market yeah. Um, be you know we did that many years ago I remember that mm -hmm. Commissioner Welch don't you yep. and then we sort of went back to you know the Northeast and international and the Canadian markets and um, if if we're able to capture them Big when they number. come to Orlando yeah. how perfect is that it's a huge number in Orlando yeah, yeah. so it's great okay um, the only other thing from me is that um, I um, wanted to bring up the citizens to be heard I um, just for um, new board members or uh, this is not the chair's decision where this is placed um, this is the county commission's decision we had a discussion about this I believe when it was Commissioner Long was chair and it that's <coughs> kind of it's not my decision and I'm very happy to bring it up because I think it's you know fair to have that discussion and and you know if you all want to make a change then we will certainly do that and so yes I would like to make a change to the beginning of the meeting I think you know we tried it always when I was mayor and the most encouraging way f for the public is to do it at a specified time or at least within a half an hour of when we start the meeting because I mean People come here and they sit for hours waiting for a chance to speak. And, I, you know, we get the same people, the ones we don't necessarily want to hear from in the first place. However, I think we discourage the other people from coming who have to work all day and who can't sit here literally half a day to wait to say a three minutes worth of, you know, input to us. If we really want the public's input, we need to make it a little easier for him, I think. That's my opinion. Always has been my opinion, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I, it's always been my opinion, too. I share that completely. I, I just think we, um, we're going the wrong direction to try to, you know, to try to dictate a policy. I think we got, we got a lot of folks that just want to come in here and, and let us know what they're thinking and feeling. We're trying to encourage that activity and to know have a little more time certain. Um, l listen to our... Our, our presentations and all of that to hear the positive side of what's going on and then talk to us before we conduct the rest of the meeting I think is the absolute right thing to do and so I would certainly like to see that too and I thought it was the the chair's prerogative that's why I've always you know whatever you have to defer to that but for me it's always been it's always been uh, the beginning of the meeting so well, thank that's you. why I wanted to make it clear yeah. Commissioner Welch there, there was a show I can't remember the name of it it was point counterpoint or something like that so, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I understand what my colleagues are saying and respect it there were and it, there is no perfect solution uh, madam vice chair 
But I, I did think it was a cherished decision because we did go through this Thanks, several times. Too. The problems we ran into is that folks who were here for agenda items were not being treated fairly because I can remember us when we got into the Meow Now and, and the cat community mm -hmm. showed up and spoke for an hour, hour and a half um, under citizens to be heard before we could even start the meeting. That happened a few times along with some of the other, you know, um, speakers who were basically harassing us, name calling, that kind of thing. That's when we decided to move it to the end of the <coughs> meeting. But also we said anyone that wanted to speak to an agenda item could speak right at that item. So if you had an agenda item, you could speak. If it's two on one, for example, you could speak right then because we wanted to have some balance. Um, so, you know, I understand both sides of it, and I, I think we were just getting – Three or four abusive people. I mean, there were racial epithets. I was a victim of that several times. Uh, that's how bad it got. Mm -hmm. And so we said, look, we're going to move this to the end of the meeting so that those folks invest something in the meeting and not just come here and set the tone of the meeting. I remember we had some yak folks here, and they set the tone of the meeting so negatively. Mm -hmm. um, and some of this was through green light and some other things. Um, term limits, you know, telling us we need to step down and all these accusations. And so there were two sides of that. We've been actually, the last year or so, it's been relatively, you know, non-confrontational. You just jinxed us. Well, I, I may have, but <laughs> I've only got a year or so. Um, so. So I get it. I get both sides of the argument. It's just when you get the extremes is when it, you know, we're sitting here for an hour and, you know, it's an issue like the meow now, and there were some other ones that popped up and just took over a meeting. That um, it didn't seem fair that to folks that were here for other business on the agenda. So I, I would be comfortable leaving it up to the chair's discretion. You'd be comfortable what? Leaving it up to the chair's discretion year to year. <laughs> it's not broken. Yeah. I, I've always been of the mindset, let folks say what they want to say for three minutes. But it's when they kind of abuse that and take over an hour, hour and a half, and and we were setting the tone with some really abusive. We tried to do standards of conduct or something. We to, did. We tried to implement that so you're not personally <laughs> that attacking. That was the year I was chair right. too. Commissioners or staff. <laughs> and so it's just, you know, if everybody lived by the golden rule, we'd be fine. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you can legislate that. So I'll leave it up to the chair's discretion. I think we're fine either way. Okay. Mr. Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it. it I, again, I, I thought it was the chair's discretion. I think I when I was chair, I think I made a decision of where we put it on the agenda. So uh, if I wasn't supposed to do that, I did it anyway. Um, but I, I, I think the trade-off for those rare occasions that Commissioner Welch describes or other situations is worth it so that when you do have citizens like we had today that come, that they don't have to wait an hour and a half, two hours. They have an opportunity to speak at the beginning of the meeting say their piece and move on um, for the general comments. So my preference is to have it at the beginning as early as possible so that the folks that, um, and I know we have some regulars that will speak at whatever time is on the agenda, but others knowing that the meeting starts at 930, their opportunity to speak is somewhere in that early part of the day. It may not be 11 or 12 or 1 or something like that. That would be my preference. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I was lucky enough to not have when I was uh, mayor to have that kind of situation happen in my city because it was a small city and we didn't have that. And we always had it in the beginning so they could come in and, and get back to dinner or whatever it is they want to get back to. Um, so it's always been, you know, just what I've done always before was to have it in the beginning. But again, I didn't have experiences like, like you all experienced in the past. Um, I do like the idea of letting people come in and know that it's a certain time frame. And if they have to take off a of work, they know it's not three hours it's within a certain time frame. Um, I think that's respectful. So I do support that. But what I would say is that I would just leave it up to the chair and the chair make their decision on how they want to run their meeting. Okay. Um, my suggestion then would be at um, the day meeting that we start at 930, that we would do it after presentations. And then um, in the afternoon meeting since we have public hearings at six o'clock or, or well excuse me nine 
sorry, 930 meeting after presentations and public hearings. And the reason is, is because some of the citizens have paid for expert advice or someone to represent them. And I think that was the other reason why when we did Meow Now, we changed it because we had people waiting three, you know, two or three hours and paying someone for waiting here as well. So if you're comfortable with that, I would do it after presentations and public hearings, because normally the 930 meeting, those public hearings aren't long. And then um, at 2 o'clock meeting, like today, I would do it right after presentations. In the daytime part? Yes. The, the two, the two, after 2 o'clock, it would be right after the presentations and proclamations, and then do citizens to be heard. Right. Is that all right? Yeah. I like that. Okay. It works. Right, that's maybe a good compromise. Okay, is there anything else to come? I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if we have an issue coming up. Oh yes, we do. <laughs> Which we are <laughs> going to have a pet issue coming up. Yes. Is there some way we can agenda that? Because we know there's going to be someday there's going to be 50 Katz. people in here wanting to talk about. That, that's an agenda item, right? That will be an agenda item. If I know, if, they, if, the, if, if I know it's coming, before, then we'll, when it's we'll not. anticipate it and work on that. Because maybe, maybe we need to ad agenda it Please for some time in the yeah. future. That's it. So if people show up, we can say that we're actually going to take a vote on this on this date. If you'd like to come back, because <laughs> mm -hmm. otherwise, and I'll tell you in Largo too, if we had a huge issue, we would start limiting them to. If we saw there was a hundred people in the audience. They'd only get two minutes or sometimes only one minute if you were going to say exactly the same thing that the last guy said. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I think there are ways around that, too. That should definitely be the chair's prerogative. Okay. Now, I don't mind, you know, that part, but well, I, I do did mind with the placement with because I remember <laughs> having this discussion with Commissioner Long about right. this. So yes. that's why it wasn't really my prerogative, in my opinion, as chair. Where is that then? How how is it not the chair, chair's prerogative? Is that written down somewhere? No, it's not written down. It we don't really chair. have policy. This yeah. is no, just I know kind of left. Know. You know how we've That's done it. business. <laughs> That's just how we've done it. Okay. <laughs> we have no really policies and rules. I know. I've Charlie tried to. I've looked get us at to some over the years. <laughs> so just. And we still have none. In a little side conversation, I, I, you asked what might be coming up. Well, meow now. <laughs> The feral cat issue is well. A that's what example. I'm saying. That's coming right. up. When emails start circulating and several of us were tagged on Facebook, you know, folks are going to come whether it's a public hearing or not, and it could be the same exact scenario. So, but I think we can also we can limit the discussion or the. I think it might be St. Pete has a like an open forum time limit, like it starts at a time certain, it runs for an hour or so. I believe that's the case. If there is anything. So maybe you could On non agendas Yeah, like open, that. open form. Yeah, so maybe you could do the, something like that. But that's yeah. a perfect example. That's what happened before. We did that in the legislature, but I thought they took that away from us. I'm not sure. Okay. It's been a long time since we've had... This discussion. That, yeah. ...that issue arise. I mean, early on, early, when uh, since I came on, early on we had several... Uh, active community members that would rally groups, and we had a lot of late nights with public testimony. But it's been a long time since we've had that just in, in general. And so I, I'd rather side on the or err on the side of allowing too much public comment than trying to limit it before we have something arise again. Right. That's why I brought it up. I wanted to hear what y'all wanted to do. Okay. All right, we are adjourned until 6 o'clock, and we'll be having our um, budget meeting tonight. Thank you.